individuals, uh, especially from foreign countries. Thank you for your call. We're going to return back to the hearing room. You can see Representative uh, Burton sitting in the chair as he's gaveled back in. Mr. Rep. Who's up next? Uh, Mr. Souter. <clears throat> Go ahead and start, and then you can come back. And... Mr. Sherman? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm here. I, I wanted to give my time to Mr. Souter. Okay, well, we'll recognize you, Mr. Shays, and you yield to Mr. Souter then. I thank you. Um, Mr. Wong, uh, thank you. I wanted to uh, ask you about um, the meeting with uh, Mr. Hubble and Mr. Riotti. Uh, the records seem to show it was at 7 a.m. on June 23rd. Do you recall that meeting? That's Exhibit uh, 101. My my recollection was not really. In, let me see. The one on, <coughs> exhibit. Personally, I did not re rec have a recollection there was a morning meeting, but I do remember there was a, the afternoon meeting. <clears throat> there, um, I think in the uh, 302s that you uh, told the Justice Department that you met, uh, that Mr. Riotti met Mr. Hubble at a breakfast meeting at Mr. Hubble's temporary office. Mr. Sauter, uh, as I reported earlier, there were, there were two meetings uh, between the Mr. Riotti and Mr. Hubble, and to a certain degree, I was also present, uh, not all the time. The one was in, related to the luncheon, and I did not join the luncheon meeting until at the tail end, I joined in, and I thought the meeting was over between them. I just barged in to their room, that the lunch meeting was at a Hey Adam in uh, Mr. Riotti's uh, room. Uh, the other one will be in, uh, in Mr. Hubble's uh, it's an office, or temporary office or whatever, in uh, Mr. Miller's uh, firm. So you don't recall whether the June 23rd meeting on uh, Mr. Hubble's schedule here, Exhibit 101, is in fact the breakfast meeting? My recollection was that the lunch meeting was the first in the afternoon. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's, let's go to the, um, uh, the, the lunch meeting is, um, well, let me, I've got the, these questions in a different order, and when we change the date, it kind of uh, confuses me a little bit. At what point, well, let me ask this question. At what point did Mr. Riotti, was it after the lunch meeting he asked you to, to check on the bank account information for Mr. Hubble? Did he ask you at, at, um, after a meeting with Mr. Riotti? I believe it's all after the whole thing is over. After the whole, after, right. so this like that June week, 25th. That week, it's, it's over, yes. So, did, so he didn't walk out of any meeting and ask you that. That was a separate conversation at the end of the week. That's a separate separate conversation, right? Um, so uh, in that on the what the record shows is that on June 23rd there was a meeting with Mr. Hubble and Mr. Riotti in Mr. Uh, Hubble's uh, log. Then. Um, but you don't, uh, you believe the luncheon meeting was first. Did, do you know who was at the breakfast meeting? My recollection, there wasn't a breakfast meeting. Um, let me move to also on June 23rd, on Exhibit 99-100, which we showed earlier, there was a meeting there with Mr. Riotti and you with Alexis Herman, the labor secretary. Um, who was at that meeting? I could not really recall on that incident. However, the records indicating there was a meeting with Mr. Uh, Ms. Herman, probably just a, 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 
a courtesy visit to Ms. Herman. It's very simple like that. Um, was this, Mark Robmeyer was also shown as being at that meeting. Uh, do you know, was this the only meeting with Mark Robmeyer that week? At that period of time, yes. Um, and for the record, could you explain who, Mi Mr. Grobmeyer is, uh, did he do work for Lippo? He was. Uh, well, he was high, at least he was uh, hired as a consultant for Lippo. Yes. Uh, probably by that time, he was no longer. Uh, I'm talking by that time, by the, uh, around June of 94, was no longer the, the consultant any further. And he's another attorney from Little Rock. That is correct. Sometimes you wonder if there are any attorneys left in Little Rock, but that's another. <laughs> they seem to mostly be here. That um, would would the uh, why would he have been at the meeting? Maybe he was trying to introduce us. To, you know, come in. He he might have known uh, Alexis Herman better than Mr. Riotti did at that time. By the way, Congress saw that if on the records indicate the meeting was very very short though. It's just a few minutes. If we were seeing Mr. Herman, what would be the point of seeing the labor secretary? She was not labor secretary then. But what was she doing at that point? I believe she was director of a public liaison at that time for the White House during that period of time, uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Sauter. That Exhibit 102 uh, shows a telephone call, uh, a receipt uh, to the White House Chief of Staff Office at 11.05, also on June 23rd? The item, uh, the item 32 you're talking about, sir? Yes. Uh, we'll now yield to Mr. Satter for his five minutes. Number 32 is the White House call. That's the 1105 call. Yeah, so it'd be item number 32. Do you know why anybody, uh, why you would have called the White House Chief of Staff Office that morning? I wouldn't know. I would not know. You know, the, definitely there were some calls being made from the Mr. Riotti's home uh, room to the White House, and uh, I did not know. So. You don't know whether it was to Mr. Milton, who was Assistant Chief of Staff? I do not know. Yeah. Um, exhibit uh, 103 shows that at 11.10, um, uh, which would be the item 35, um, there's a telephone call to the Democratic Leadership Council. Do you know who made that call or for what purpose? I don't know what it's, uh, I cannot recall on that, but if anybody would call, it would be, I had a relationship with the DLC, Democratic Leadership Council, with uh, Mr. Al Form. I believe he was the uh, executive director for the DLC, and uh, more or less just a courtesy visit to, to visit Al Form, that's about all. Well, if well, that was a situation like that. Would the gentleman yield real briefly? Uh, Mr. Sauter asked uh, why a call from Mr. Riotti's room would go to the chief of staff's office, and you said you didn't know. And then just now, there, there was a call to the Democrat Leadership Council from James Riotti's rooms, and you said that you probably would have made that call. Is that correct? No. The, the only thing is that Mr. Riotti did not have any connections with okay, the DLC. Okay, so, so there was a call to the Democrat Leadership Council's office. Would that have been your call? The only way if, you can lead he, it to that would be me. Yes, maybe okay, me. Okay, so you were in the room at the same time that he called the Chief of Staff's office, because right. that was only five minutes before. Let me, let me Mr. Chairman. So if, now, let me just finish. Sure. If, 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 if you were in the room five minutes before you called the Democrat Leadership Council for some reason, why wouldn't you have known why he was calling the chief of staff at the White House? That was a very good question, Mr. Chairman. 
I was really trying to say I did not really remember what was the content about why he called. There was a, I did also su support it. There were quite a lot of calls being made between the uh, Mr. Riotti's uh, uh, hotel room and the, and the White House, sir. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Then at uh, 12 o'clock, uh, I think the records show in uh, Exhibit 101 that you had uh, a meeting with uh, Mr. Hubble at the Hay Adams. That's the lunch you were referring to earlier at 12 o'clock on Exhibit 101. That is luncheon I was referring to that I recall to. So, um, uh, and what was uh, the purpose of this meeting? The basics that Mr. Riotti on the chair was Mr. Uh, Hubble. And I was not, you know, involving in the luncheon until the tail end I came back from outside. Yesterday you, t you told me that, uh, to your knowledge, that whenever there were meetings between Mr. Riotti and Mr. Hubble that you sent them up, had they met a number of times before? Had you set up other meetings before? Prior to this? Yes. I didn't believe so, sir. So to your knowledge, even th that this, at least in this time period, was the only meeting between... I believe that the was the first meeting, uh, Mr. Sauter. And uh, you don't know what the, uh, they chatted about? I don't know the detail, and... Uh, well, what would be some non-detail kind of general feeling? Uh, Mr. Sonder, let me, let me offer this way to you. Mr. Riotti did previously have conversation with me, and I did convey the information to him previously about the people who would like to, you know, suggest to help uh, Mr. Hubble. And I remember I mentioned to you yesterday about the set up a trust fund situation, the limit was the $15,000, the limit. That was over the phone. He did not really give me any response about that, all right? And uh, later on, he came over here, he asked me the opinion. I said, if you really want to help a person, you want to help people in need. That's all I offer on that basis. And I sort of left everything for him. Now, if you want me to say what was involved in the meeting, I believe that was related to, you know, anything related to this. So he, did Mr. Riotti tell you after he came out any comments that Mr. Hubble might have made or any impressions? Did you talk about the meeting with him? No, I did not even ask about that. The um, Exhibit 104 shows that then at two o'clock, another phone call over to the White House. Um, do you know what the purpose of that phone call would have been? Let's see. So I don't have the number in front of me. It was for the office of the number of White House uh, personnel. That's 4567510 in the log there. I, I could not Probably recall specifically. Right after the lunch was completed. Uh, Mr. Saudi, did you mention that was related to White House personnel? Yes. Okay. You know why you'd called White House personnel in that period? Maybe d during a slack time, you just want to go over to visit some of the friends. Yeah. Um, Chairman, I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Sauter, be given an additional five minutes. I th Without objection. Um, then uh, the uh, next day, Exhibit 105, uh, shows that there was a lunch at the White House mess with Mr. Riotti, his family, and, and Mark Middleton. Do you recall that? I remember there was a, there was a lunch in, involved, but I was not attending. So you, you did not attend this lunch? Right. Um, do you know? I, I was there, though, outside waiting in the reception room, as I reported to you yesterday. Do you know, was there anyone there besides, it says on the schedule, Mr. and Mrs. Rowdy and their children, uh, and it's on Mark Middleton's schedule, was anyone else at the luncheon that you know of or might have stopped by? Now, let me retract a little bit. There might be two luncheons involved. One luncheon was involving just Mrs. Riotti and the children and myself in the White House mess. There was a separate luncheon 
which I did not attend. I was waiting outside in the reception room. That involved Mr. Riati and Mr. Middleton. That, in terms of who went to that luncheon, I did not know for sure on that. Do you have any idea what the purpose of this luncheon was at 12 o'clock on June 24th? Now, if this is a day referring to with the, with the families, the children, it just a, an experience things for the, for the Mrs. Eileen Riati and the children to be having an opportunity of dining in the mess. I mean, just as a casual observer, um, we're having a lot of experiential time with Mr. Middleton's schedule here. Uh, we've, I think there's three different appointments. There's a lunch. Uh, presumably has something, uh, I mean, some, the, the reason it's hard not to believe there weren't any substantive discussions is, is that it isn't as though they didn't already see him a couple times earlier and, and seeing him more. Uh, and it's hard to believe there weren't any substantive discussions because there's only so much socializing you do. I mean, it's not like they were real buddy-buddy here. Mr. Sauter, I, I can offer this way because he was the only, only person we know better to get us in. So we always call on the same person to get, let him clear us in on that basis. So you don't think he stayed at the lunch? You Thomas about staying? In my lunch, and I didn't believe, uh, with the children and the- Mr. Middleton. Mr. Middleton. In my lunch, he did not. He just, he just uh, booked book us in. I didn't believe he, he was at a luncheon with us. Um, but he had a luncheon with Riyadi on the, the other luncheon I was talking about. And do you know what was discussed at that luncheon? No, I don't know. And Mr. Riyadi didn't discuss anything with you about that? He did not. So, in effect, what you're saying is there were a lot of social calls, but there was one very substantive luncheon, most likely, because uh, it was done without you or the children present. I don't know whether it's substantive or not, yeah. But they'd already done their social calls. I mean, in effect, you've testified that you've had multiple social calls with him. He did a social call to get you into the luncheon. So the social call part's kind of done, and then they have another luncheon. Yeah, excuse me. I really don't know about that, yeah. I think, and, and I know you weren't present, I just... Right. Um, on, on Exhibit 106, there's a uh, receipt, uh, another phone call over to Debbie Sean at the uh, Executive Office Building. Um, Sean, is it? Sean, yeah. Sean. Yes. Um, do you know what that purpose would have been? No, just a courtesy. Sean is coming from our community. She's a Korean-American, and we knew her before. So it was a, a courtesy call. It's just basically we'll make a round, yeah. Um, do you know who called 4567510 at 216, which is in Exhibit uh, 106 as well? Ms. Sada, you had to help me on the, what is 7510's department? Is it personnel? Personnel. Probably that's, I do remember we, we met with uh, Maria Haley. I believe she was also working at that time working in the personnel department, as also old friends from Arkansas time, you know, just went over to see her, say hello. Uh, would the gentleman I, yield? Happy to yield. Did you uh, discuss with her uh, your future position at the Department of Commerce when you were in there? I might have, but my, my position was determined, I believe. I, I know you said that. Right. But we're looking at the sequence of events here that led up to Webb Hubble getting $100,000 from the Riottis, and then a short time later, you were appointed to an important position at the Department of Commerce. On this list, it shows that you met with a lot of people, and then you met with the personnel director there at the White House. Did you discuss with her your position at the Department of Commerce that was coming up, or the possibility you'd be getting that job? I've already got an offer at that time. I mentioned to her that I will be coming to the Commerce Department. So you did talk to her about the job at the Commerce Department? That is correct. At, in Exhibit 107, if we could go to 107, um, once again, where I think this is Mr. Hubble's schedule again, it shows um, uh, June 24th at 5 o'clock that Mr. Riotti met with Mr. Hubble. Do you remember that meeting? Yes, I do. And who was at that meeting? Uh, Mr. Riotti and I went over there 
and Mr. Riyadi and Mr. Hubble went into the room to, to discuss matters. I was sitting outside in a small conference room. Where did it take place, did you say? I think it's Mr. Miller's office on 19th and or 20th in the M Street in that corner. Who's he? Mr. Miller, I believe, he used to be the, the Treasury Secretary. Was it Gene Miller? I think he was the, the official in the previous uh, either Reagan administration. Will the gentleman yield to me for a quick question? I'll yield. You mentioned $100,000 that Mr. Riati gave to Webb Hubble, and you said it because of friendship. But was he expecting some work in exchange for that, or was he simply giving a gift? I, I, I do know some are basically trying to ask him to do a certain thing, but I don't know the specific things at that time. You know. I, hire him as a, as a consultant type of things. But he was planning to hire him to do something in exchange for the $100,000. You don't know whether the work was done, but did you know that they, he was being hired or just given the gift? No, in other words, you will hire him to do whatever the works, you know, he can help the, the LIPO situation. More specifically, I did not know at that time. But it was $100,000 to hire him. That is correct. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Waxman, uh, I'm not very clear whether I knew that at that time that $100,000 was, was, um, was mentioned or not. Uh, normally, that would be the amount of money in practice that Mr. Riati would do. For instance, on Mark Romeyer's situation, was started like $100,000. So you get another consultant, probably would be a logical amount. I, w I will have to venture to guess on that. Mr. LaTourette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to yield to uh, Mr. Souter. And I, I think it's important to point out for the record that yesterday under oath, when I asked you the question, was this predomin predominantly a job or was this predominantly out of friendship, you said that it was predominantly out of friendship. And when you raised it to Mr. Riotti, you raised that we should help him out of friendship. So the degree that it was a job, there might have been tasks given, but you do not recall the specifics of the task, and in fact, you st stated again today, earlier, that you felt that this was predominantly to help out a friend who is in need, not a job. That's correct. Um, that um, on, um, uh, I wanted to follow up, why, um, you do not recall the breakfast meeting, but Mr. Hubble had a breakfast meeting. You. You, we discussed the earlier luncheon meeting, and then there was another meeting at 5 o'clock with Mr. Hubble. Why do you believe there were at least two and possibly three meetings needed? The, the, the reason I remember those two is because I was there. Yes, but why do you think that they needed so much time together? Uh, because it's clearly beyond courtesy. It's clearly now beyond the point of, of even saying, hey, I'm in real trouble. I need the money. Uh, these are pretty lengthy time periods now, all in one day. Now, the f that was a different day. Uh... Uh, the breakfast was on the 23rd, but you didn't recall that. The lunch, you're right, the lunch, the f two were on the 23rd and one was on the 24th. Mr. Sada, I, I really, deep down in my heart, I did not think there was a breakfast meeting. Okay, so you know, let's say there were two meetings. Why, right. why would two uh, meal meetings be needed here? Uh, as I also mentioned to you, the logical way of thinking, they have not seen each other for a while, really have sit down to chat. The first one is basically warming up and check, chatting. The following meeting was talking about more detailed in, in his office. At what point did Mr. Riotti ask you to check into his bank account? After those two meetings. What Apparently the meeting was over. Mr. Riotti thought there was one, one item missing, maybe I ought to get his bank account. So I believe, I don't know exactly the date, I believe I called Mr. Hubble to find out where his bank account was, you know, to have the funds to be in wire. So I passed the number back to either Lippo or back to Mr. Riotti. I don't remember exactly whom I did. Could you ex precisely explain to me what get his bank account means? You, you said you called Mr. Hubble. Did you ask him what his assets were? Or his current cash flow, is that what the... Oh, no. 
to do that, I, I knew probably the decision has already been made to, to offer help to him. The money has to be coming in, in. So you just wanted a number of where to send the money? That's correct, to facilitate the wire, the, 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 the sending the money. Okay, um, is, excuse me a second. Is this his 302? Okay, in the um, 302 from the Justice Department on page 42, uh, the, the, the recollection, if you want to, uh, it's DOJ H000065. That is at the bottom page number. It says, according to the FBI's recounting of your conversation, during the last week of June 1994, Hubble and Jay Riotti had a breakfast meeting in Hubble's temporary office at 19th and M in Washington, D.C. Um, Wong was outside the door during the meeting pursuant to Riotti's request. Now, you're saying that that, that was actually a lunch? Was a I think I was referring to was meeting in Mr. Miller's office. I was waiting outside the room. But according to this uh, deposition, it starts out by saying that you recall a breakfast meeting. Then you also recall that they had a lunch meeting. Uh, and the breakfast meeting, by the way, is on Mr. Hubble's schedule. And then in the evening, they had a, a another meeting. Um, and I'm confused as to why the FBI is reporting that you said, in effect, three, and the records show three, uh, and what the discrepancy is. Congressman, <clears throat> number one, that was not really a, a FBI deposition at the time, all right? And um, I never review about 302. I want to testify to you on that. I assume FBI might probably confuse the, you know, by Hubble's, Mr. Hubble's diary for that. I always asserted that it was two meeting for sure, that in my mind. I, I mean, will, uh, there, is it possible there was a meeting you weren't aware of that shows up in Mr. Hubble's diary? Everything is possible, though. You know, it's very unlikely that at that period of time, if there's something that I'm not, I was not if, aware of. If I could ask for five additional minutes, I think I can finish up with my Hubble questioning. Is that acceptable? Without objection. Um, that um, in the, it um, also shows on the evening of June 24th, there was a call made to the Indonesian ambassador um, at 8.04. Do you know what? That's uh, uh, on Exhibit 108. I can generally talk about that. Whenever Mr. Riyadi is in town, he's trying to make a round to see, pay the courtesy visit to various people and, you know, renew the friendship. He and um, Mr. Ambassador, Indonesian Ambassador, were friends and back to Indonesia. And then at uh, 9.50, there was a call once again over to White House personnel. In the evening? Yes. That also shows up in Exhibit 108. Presumably that wasn't a, a courtesy call at 9.50. That's the same number as earlier we determined was 456750 was uh, White House personnel. It was the third. There was a call to that same number on June 23rd, and there was a call in the afternoon on June 24th, and then another call in the night of June 24th to the same number. 
I, I could not explain to you on that, no. Then after that call, uh, would the gentleman you real briefly? Yes, but I have a, uh, I'll, we'll get you some more time. Uh, were you in Riotti's room when he made that call at 9.50 that night? I could not recall that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, because... But you know, you said that when you'd gone to the White House personnel office earlier, that uh, you had discussed your potential job over at the Department of Commerce. Now here we have a call just a day or so before Mr. Hubble gets the uh, $100,000 at 9.50 at night again to the personnel office. This obviously was not a courtesy call. So was Mr. Riotti uh, talking to them about your job to make sure you were getting that job at the Department of Commerce, or uh, was this just another courtesy call? Mr. Chairman, I really don't know about that. As I stated to you before, my employment has nothing to do with the, this, uh, Mr. Hubble's, the money to Mr. Hubble. Um, the, um, there was another call, by the way, to the Indonesian ambassador that night at 1010. Uh, but, but that was at another, you don't know any particular business? or I don't. I don't. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about on June 25th, uh, did you and Mr. Riotti and his family attend the President's radio address? Yes. Um, the White House records do not show an entry time. Do you know how you got into the White House that day? Forget about the records. Do you remember how you got into It's possible you drove into the White House complex, uh, and, but if so, it would have had to have been specially arranged. No, I think we went in just as a routine, went through security, and if I remember correctly, just like everyone else was going in. Well, that usually would be logged. It's very strange. I, I didn't recall there was any special arrangement for us to, to, to be in the, for the radio address, sir. Hey, um, I'd like to show the videotape on the radio address, if we could uh, show that at this point. going to be when the when the camera goes off are you and the realities the only ones left with the president that is correct probably mr sada we will probably last uh, last uh, if it's not the last one it will be the next to the last ones the um was it arranged beforehand that that would be the case no we just purposely stay stay late to be the last how long did you stay? Not very long. But the reason for that is that the family with the kids were there. They were trying to get a family photo with the president. So there weren't any substantive discussions you were just posing for photos? I didn't spot anything on that, sir. Um, and to your knowledge, there was, you say there might have been one other person left, or? I don't know. But we were very, very dead in the last, yeah. Almost to the last, yeah. And it's, it's your testimony that there wasn't any special arrangement uh, for private time or anything regarding that? No, sir. No, sir. It was just, uh, wouldn't other people, were there any other kids there? I mean, wouldn't other people want to hang around the uh, last two? I didn't recall, though. Because usually nobody clears out of the room until there's a forced clearing out of the room. I mean, I, I hate to admit this, okay, but I was at a radio address. Sure. Now, it, wasn't that, it was not a radio address here in Washington, but it was at the Summit of Americas, and there was a large group like that. Then at that point, nobody really wants to leave. Uh, I mean, I might have, but that was beside the point. But the, most, most people um, uh, wanted to, uh, then they clear them out. I was not the only member of Congress present. For example, uh, now Speaker Hastert was there as well. Uh, then there was time before he had the next appointment with which to have a substantive discussion. That's fairly standard that everybody leaves at the same time, or I mean, assume that's what generally happens at events. But your testimony is, is there was no private discussions to your knowledge. There was no prearranged time after the radio address that after the camera went off, everybody else cleared out except maybe one, but you and the family. No, 
No, actually, I was taking a photo as well. Okay. No. But there were, it no special the arrangement, no, sir. Okay, I, I uh, may have some closing comments with this, but I thank your for your patience and your uh, willingness to try to address these uh, questions. Would the gentleman want to finish up? If he wants um, more time, I'd certainly be willing to agree to it. Okay, I'll just, I, my, my concern is, is that what we... Gentlemen, you recognize for five more minutes. Yeah. Thanks. My, my concern is, uh, what we've seen is, um, in a period of, of the 21st to the 25th, um, that, uh, that you and Mr. Riotti went to the White House uh, six times, you saw the President three times, you called the White House four times, that we're debating whether there was a meeting with Mr. Riotti and Mr. Hubble two or three times, uh, that, uh, and after all this happened in one week, which uh, is a lot of courtesy calls, and in fact, repeated courtesy calls, Mr. Riotti gave Mr. Hubble $100,000, not for a uh, particular uh, job, although there might have been some work with it, but, but to help a friend. And your testimony here at this hearing yesterday and today is, that in all those meetings, other than directly with Mr. Roddy and Mr. Hubble, there was no discussions about support for Mr. Hubble? I was aware of no. That you're, you're aware of none. Your testimony is not that there were none, but that you're aware of none. Is that, that, that is size? correct. Uh, <clears throat> but your testimony is that it's possible that Mr. Riotti, in a number of these meetings, could have been talking about the need to support Mr. Hubble, uh, but he wouldn't have necessarily told you. I, I, fact, could not, you, I could not speculate on that, sir, Mr. Congressman. In fact, you, you did speculate earlier because you said you, did, you didn't speculate. You said you didn't even ask any questions. I did not. So uh, the fact is, is that there could have been discussions and you wouldn't have known because you didn't even ask any questions. Even though you were, even though you were, um, even though you were the point person who was asking Mr. Riotti to give the money to Mr. Hubble, right. um, and you, you were the person who was setting up these meetings and making a lot of these phone calls and, and setting up the radio address, you didn't even ask Mr. Riotti whether or not he talked with anybody about it. Whatever you suggest, uh, Mr. Congressman, uh, it was possible. But in my mind, it was not likely. The reason is the $100,000 was really not a large amount of money, you know. So I never really, you know, think that would be, you know, any special thing he would have to do. Well, let me ask you a question about that. I mean, to me, $100,000 is a lot of money, and I think to most people. Uh, but uh, it certainly was a lot of money to Mr. Hubble, right? That is correct. And that um, it was certainly important to Mr. Hubble's friends because they had uh, the law partner, former law partner of Bruce Lindsay call you and say, look, our friend's in trouble. He needs some help. His kids need it. It was important to people who were associated with the White House uh, that there was support. Um, it, it's just hard to imagine that there wouldn't have been people saying, hey, we really hope you'll help our friend. Uh, uh, he's really in trouble. Uh, that, that no discussions occurred in all these phone conversations, all these meetings, all the meetings with Mark Middleton. I mean, these people are friends from Little Rock. What we've heard is Mark Grobmeyer's from Little Rock, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we, did, we ran into a whole series of attorneys from Little Rock. They're friends of Webb Hubble. Webb Hubble's in trouble. Uh, this is a man who comes into town, has a series of meetings, and at the end of this gives him $100,000 to help him. It's just hard to imagine that there weren't discussions. I mean, the average person watching this, you may not know. Uh, uh, you didn't ask any questions about it. But I think that the evidence kind of suggests that uh, we don't know the extent of the discussions, whether they were casual or uh, in-depth. Uh, but it's certainly, without people willing to come forth who were in the meetings and talk to us, a lot of Americans are looking at this and saying, boy, this sure looks like hush money. And, and your testimony today didn't really do anything to prove that, but it didn't do anything really to disprove it either. And in fact, I would think it would be a legitimate question to ask those people. Mr. Saad, I, you know, I can, I try to be helpful as much as I can, but I'm li limited to to the fact that I can only testify what I know, what I, I really know about that. And, and I absolutely agree with that. And you should not, while I might ask you your opinion, that's still different than a fact. And nobody is convicted until there's a fact. 
but part of our problem here is a lot of people won't talk to us and a lot of people and I realize you're at, at one level and some people have implied that you're at a higher level than you probably are because if in fact you don't know the answers to some of these questions you can't be the center of a conspiracy if there is a conspiracy which has not been proven but if there is one you're clearly at a, a, a level that's moving up here but you can see I would hope that at least why we're asking the questions because to an average observer looking at this this was a very questionable active week and I appreciate I how, that you've tried to answer the questions and and I thank you for your patience Will the and gentleman I'm, yield to sorry me? and I'll be happy to yield to yeah, thank you, you. just is that, just so, so I understand where things are y you knew that uh, people wanted to help Webb Hubble and uh, and that uh, you even said to Mr. Riotti Mr. Hubble's in trouble so Mr. Riotti gave Hubble a hundred thousand dollars is there anything that you know of that would indicate that that was given as hush money to to keep mr hubble from not saying something or this, just that they wanted to help him out uh, when he was down the terms of hush has never came to my mind at that time uh and at later date i always felt it was a, a friendship that is a, you know, to help a friend. I thank the gentleman for yielding to me. Of course, that's partly what hush money is. In other words, friends usually don't go and turn in other friends, and they support one another in a network. Um, and while it might not be the case in this case, it could be, and our dilemma in a lot of these kind of things is, is that it could be or couldn't. Our job is to continue to try to prove that. But um, we moved along and laid out a series of events that I think most Americans will have serious doubts about. The gentleman yield to me further. I, I don't know why you see your job as trying to prove that. It seems to me our job is to try to find out what the facts are. And uh, uh, Some people have speculated and maybe would like to think that there was hush money involved, and maybe you would like to prove there's hush money involved, but all we can do is find the evidence that we have before us and the witness who had some knowledge of things that were going on can tell us what he knew and to this point there's no evidence what we would hush money um, it's your time reclaiming my time that um, it's clear that Webb Hubble hasn't talked uh, it's clear that um, that we haven't been able, we have 120 some witnesses who have either taken a fifth or fled the country to this committee. Um, I believe that that's what's been proven is that there's obstruction of justice. We don't know what justice has been obstructed, whether it was uh, secrets of the United States, whether it was political compromises, whether it was the multiplicity of interests of Mr. Riotti. Uh, there's lots of possibilities, but the goal here wasn't to prove that this was hush money. What we know is he's been hushed. What we don't know is whether there was any payoffs that did that, whether it was choice because he's a friend of the president. Well, uh, we don't know what he was hushed about, but we know they aren't talking. Gentlemen, yield for one other comment. Look, we, we know that Mr. Hubble testified before the grand jury. He cooperated with the, uh, ind uh, the independent counsel, not to the independent counsel's satisfaction, obviously. And maybe the problem is he's not saying, not because of hush money, but he's just not saying what people want him to say because that's not what he thinks is, uh, that's not what he believes. Maybe people want Webb Hubble to say what they want him to say. But he's testified over and over again, and he hasn't said what they want him to say. Now, that could be for whatever reason, but it could be also because it's the truth. And, and, and this will be hopefully final comment with this extended uh, red light, is, is that while I agree that that's a possible, I don't think it's probable because there have been so many. I don't remember what we discussed at that meeting. I can't quite recall. Um, that it stretches plausibility to believe it's been completely open. But I agree that that is a possibility and that in this country you're innocent until proven guilty. And any suggestion that I've had that it's been proven, I've tried to say over and over, it hasn't been proven, that, but that that's why many of us think it's there, even if it hasn't been proven and nobody is guilty until it's proven. The gentleman's time has expired. I'd like to take uh, some time now. Uh, Mr. Wong, you went to the White House, to the personnel office, a short time before Mr. Hubble got the 200, or got the hundred thousand dollars, 
you said that you talked to the personnel people in passing about you were going to be working over at the Department of Commerce. And you said that that was already a done deal before any of this happened. But then that night, uh, there was another call to the personnel director at 9.50, I believe it was. And you don't know what that call was about. It was from Riotti's room at the Hay Adams Hotel. And you don't remember whether or not you were present. Do you have any idea why Mr. Riotti would be calling the personnel office of the White House just before the 100000 was given to uh, Mr. Hubble? I have no idea. I don't have any clue at you this You don't moment. know that he was trying to help anybody get a job, I mean, or anything? It would be really unlikely, Mr. Chairman. So you have no idea why he would call the personnel office? That's correct, sir. Now, you went to the Commerce Department, and you started working there. During the time you were at the Commerce Department, from your home, from your office, and across the street at the Stevens Company, you made or received 232 contacts from the Lippo Group in Indonesia and here in the United States and in Hong Kong. Why did you make calls from the Stevens office across the street, and why did you send faxes from the Stevens office across the street to the Lippo Group? Why didn't you do that either from your home or from the Commerce Department? Why did you feel it was necessary to go to an outside office to do that? Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, there are quite a few questions there. You know, I'm trying to answer well, portion just, by portion. Let's narrow it down to one. Okay. Why did you go across the street to the Stevens office to contact the Lippo Group with faxes and phone calls when you had a phone in your office? I'm not even sure those faxes were sent to Lippo by me through the Stevens office across the streets. I did use the Stevens finance office. Sometimes I make some personal call, which I did not feel as proper to use the, the, the office phone. OK, did you call the Lippo group or send any faxes from the Stevens office? I certainly did not recall. But I do remember Stephen finance, uh, Stephen office did send some faxes to Lippo group. That's their own business, though. Yeah. You did not send any faxes from the Stevens office to the Lippo Group. Is that what you're saying? I do not recall. I did. You do not recall. Right. You don't remember going across the street to that office. I really did not. You really don't. I really did don't. Did you make any phone calls from across the street to the Lippo Group from the Stevens office? You, you confine the Lippo Group as of any calls to Indonesia, to uh, uh, the offices here in the United States, to Hong Kong? I really don't remember a call overseas if I did any of a call related to Lippo. So you don't remember? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, well, why would you go over there and call the Lippo group in the United States? I don't believe I, I, I used the Stephen Finance primarily for the... To well, now, I want, you to, I want you to think hard about this because you have your counsel there. You are under oath, and we're going to check this out very thoroughly. Do you recall or did you make any phone calls to the Lippo Group here in the United States or overseas that you recall? Did you send any faxes from the Stevens office to any Lippo entity while you were at the Department of Commerce? I did not recall, sir. You don't recall? I do not recall. You recall going over to their office? I did. What did you do when you went to their office? There are some personal things. We, for instance, I can raise the, uh, the example to you. I was still the member of a committee of 100. Yes. I used the office to sometimes ask them to send facts over there. I did not feel the... Okay, well, let's pursue that. You were a member of the committee of 100. Now, Could the I... committee of 100 was a financial raising organization, wasn't it? Did, did they raise money? No, no, I, did, I didn't think so. Well, what, what, what was the purpose of that organization? Its organization just basically promote the, the mutual understanding, you know, between the Chinese people 
and, and ours to the American people. That's one of them, as and far as I know. Before you went to the Department of Commerce, did you ever work with any of them to raise money? Now, in terms of raising money for the organization or raising money for, for other campaigns, did you ever work with any of those people in that organization to raise money before you? To the went? best of knowledge, I did not. You did not. None of those people were contributors to the to the DNC. No, you don't know that. I don't know for a fact, but I, not through me, definitely. When you went to the DNC, did any of those people uh, contribute? I mean, pretty large contributions. Mr. Chairman, I take it back. Excuse me, I had to tell the truth. The one member, that was before I became a member of a Committee of 100. One member, so Dr. Pai did make contribution in August 1992 event. Okay, well while you were at the Department of Commerce and you went over to the Stevens office, did you ever ask anybody for money in phone calls from the Stevens office? No, sir. You're sure? I'm sure. Okay. So you never made any calls that you recall. You don't recall calling the Lippo Group from the Stevens office. And you don't recall calling the Lippo Group uh, or sending them faxes from the Stevens office. I do not recall. So if we find that there were phone calls, what is this here? Okay. I have here, do we have a, can we put this up on the board? And I ask for five additional minutes <coughs> without objection, so ordered. We don't have this to put it up on the board? Okay. Um, we have here from September, or from uh, July 19th, 1994 through January 30th, 1995, there must be 30 or 40 faxes going to the Lippo in Hong Kong, director of the Lippo Bank, Lippo Hong Kong, Lippo Pacific, uh, director of the Lippo Bank, Lippo Asia Limited, Lippo Pacific. You don't recall having any involvement with any of these? I do not recall. Let me stress that Stevens Group has some business. He used to be a partner between Lippo and Stevens. They might have some business to do. The man in charge was a man named Vernon Weaver? That is correct. I intend to bring Mr. Weaver before the committee and put him under oath. Now, Mr. Weaver was there when you were there, was he not? That's correct. Okay, now would he, uh, if I ask him if all of these uh, faxes and phone calls were from him to the Lippo Group, you think he's going to say that, uh, that they were from him or somebody on his staff? I believe he would tell the truth, though. Okay, well, we'll, we'll find out. We'll get in touch with him. Uh, I'd like to make a copy of this and have it put on the uh, record. Now, let me ask you a couple of other questions. Uh, you uh, met a number of times with people from the People's Republic of China, the Communist Chinese government, while you were at the Department of Commerce, did you not? Did you have lunch with them or dinner with any of them? I have lunch with some of the uh, uh, em uh, embassy personnel, yes. Do you remember how many times? I can't recall them. Probably it's not too many, no. Did you go to the Chinese embassy? I did. How many times? Not too many, probably under invitation basis for whatever event they have. Was it one time, five oh, times? It definitely is more than one time, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Did, what, do you remember what you talked about? No, it was a big gathering, probably just saying hello, that's all. Just saying hello. Meeting with the various people. A lot of people were there with the big functions. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you were at the Department of Commerce at the time? That is correct. Okay. On January the 19th, 1995, your calendar reflects that you met with the PRC ambassador, Lee Dow, for dinner. Do you recall that? Can I, can I read that, please? Yes, uh, sure. Is that, do we have it in his book? What, where is it? Show where that is for him, will you? What, 
to what page is that? What is it? 167. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, is that Exhibit 167? Exhibit 167, page 17. I want to bring this guy in from Stevens. I want to have him come in. Ask him to come in voluntarily if we could subpoena him. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, as you indicated, list on my calendar, the secretary kept my calendars. There was a dinner over there. January, January, do you know what you talked about on January the 19th, 1995, with the PRC Ambassador Lee Dow? If I remember correctly, there was uh, an invitation, work through another commun Chinese American community uh, a member who invites some of the uh, a Chinese American government official to have a dinner with the Mr. Mr. Ambassador Lee. Did you go? I did not go. You did not go? I did not go. On February the 14th, 1995, you have a reception with the People's Republic of China minister counselor named Ming. Did you go to that? This is on exhibit... Uh, I presume it's on 168. Okay. It's February the 15th. I believe down below it says on Wisconsin Avenue, maybe, is the address. It says uh, reception with the PRC Minister Counselor Ming. Where, where was that located? Oh, his commercial counselor Ming, is, they just opened up a separate office, was opening the, the, a, a invitation to have a lot of people going over there. You I didn't, did go. I did you, go. Do you, do, you, do you recall what you talked about or anything, or was it just a social event? It's a social event. Uh, yeah. Okay. On April the 5th at 10 a.m., your calendar reflects Ms. Zhu Yan, PRC Deputy Director for uh, UI, I believe that's Far East Relation. Did you go to that? Oh, I did not go to that. I, they came to me. What did you talk about? No, that was arranged, uh, Mr. Chairman, by, I think, AID. The, some of the people from China that was uh, touring in the United States, that meeting was arranged by AID to come to, to, uh, to visit me. was not my initiative, sir. Well, uh, I see my time has expired. Uh, I'll come back to this later. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I want you to have the continuity if you want to continue on, but if you if you wouldn't mind, would you yield to me just for a second or two? Sure, I'll be happy to. Make some to. points for the record. Okay, well, I'll, yes. Uh, I, I don't want to take my five minutes, but the, uh, which I'll do later, but I, the question of this committee of 100, what, what is that group again, Mr. Wong? It's committee of 100, yeah. And, and what, what the was The base it? is the leading uh, distinguished Ch Chinese Americans who formed the groups after the Tiananmen Square. Uh, event in 1989, I think. Uh, the chairman said that this group was under, under some suspicion, but I do want to point out in the congressional record of March 22, 1994, Senator McCain said, and I'm quoting from Senator McCain's record statement, I have long admired the work of the Committee of 100 and the very distinguished members that represent it. The members of the committee represent Chinese Americans from all over the nation and across a wide range of political opinions and professions. To give my colleagues an idea of the caliber of people making up the organization, I commend to them the biographies of three members who recently visited my office, one of whom, Ms. Ming Chen Xu, is an uh, Arizona resident. The biographies are somewhat dated, but I think they illustrate well the competence of the Committee of 100 delegation. Second point I wanted to make was that Mr. Weaver, uh, Chairman said that he was going to bring Mr. Weaver in to question whether you had made those calls or, or not. Did, 
as I recall, we deposed Mr. Weaver in the last Congress, and I think we've asked those questions, so we're checking to see whether we already know whether Mr. Weaver uh, has, has testified, uh, so we don't have to bring him in if he's already testified on the subject. We'll find out soon what he had to say, and we'll put that in the record. And without objection, maybe I'll ask him we put his testimony in the record on, the, on those points if, uh, if you think it's appropriate. Yeah, we uh, we may bring Mr. Weaver. In fact, I plan to bring Mr. Weaver in again because, he, according to my staff, the information that we have now we did not have at that time, and those questions were not presented to him, especially on these list of phone calls and list of faxes that were sent. So we we may have to talk to him again. Well, we'll but I have no objection to putting in the record. Well, then let's let me let's just withhold it and okay. see what see what it comes up with okay. in the transcript to find out if that, he's been asked these questions. That will be fine. I think. And then uh, let me ask you, Madam Consent, Chairman, be given. Ten minutes. And ten minutes. Ten minutes. If you, if, without objection, let me just let me just say that the committee of 100. Uh, I don't want it to uh, uh, appear as though we've cast aspersions on that organization. What I was asking was whether or not any of those people, while you were at the Department of Commerce, were solicited and gave money to the DNC, or when you were at the DNC. And I believe your answer was there was one individual, but uh, you did not solicit any of them. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, I believe I, what I was saying is back in 1992, there was one individual, maybe even more than one individual. At that time, I was not even a committee of 100 member then, mm -hmm. uh, made a contribution to the candidate Clinton's campaign at that time. Oh, but while you were at the Department of Commerce, you While I was in commerce, commerce, no. And while I was in DNC, the answer is yes. You did? In DNC, that was the answer is yes. I see. Probably about... In one event, maybe around few checks. Do you have any idea who those people were, how many there were? Yes, I can give you at least at this time when I can remember well, some of the like names. What I'd like to do is, for the record, if you could give us the names and, and the amounts, if you could recollect those for us. Right now, I can offhand, off my head, I give you one right now. is Lily Chan did give some money. The amount I don't remember. That was related in uh, um, September 19... 96 event in LA. And you were with the DNC at the time? I was in DNC at okay, that time. Well, any, anyhow, if you could give us a list of those from the 100 uh, group, because we sure, may want to follow up with them. Ask that. them a question about that. Uh, did you have any responsibility for China issues when you were at Commerce? I mean, what were you, did you have any responsibility or were you charged with the responsibility of dealing with China on Commerce issues, com uh, issues of that type? No. Why not? The, the basically the territory was taken away and it was under the umbrella of Mr. Uh, Rothkoff, uh -huh. who was the deputy uh, undersecretary. So they did not want you to be involved in uh, commerce issues with the Department of uh, with China at that time. I mean that was not your responsibility, right? That was not my responsibility. That's correct. So. You had a number of meetings, and I'll go through these meetings again chronologically, but you had a number of meetings with people from the Chinese embassy, from the Chinese uh, people who were coming in and out from China. Uh, you had those meetings at the Department of Commerce, at the Chinese embassy, and other places. Why were you meeting with those people? No, it was by invitation. You know, whenever there was a function event, uh, I was invited to go. Like uh, quite a other officials also received invitation as well. Mm -hmm. I just went. Okay, well, let's go through these because some of these, I don't think there were widely attended events. Some of these were just lunch or dinner with one or two people. Let's go through these. Okay. Uh, you reflected a meeting with uh, Ambassador Designate uh, to China, Jim Sasser. Do you remember what that meeting was about? Yes. What was that about? The meeting I was trying to. Uh, at that time, was it was a designate as an ambassador was not being That's confirmed. Right. Uh, I have a few of the committee, 100 members, to to visit his temporary office at that time. So you I, took the, you took them over there. No, I did not. I came with the other members of a committee, 100, to go to see Mr. Sasser's. Okay. 
on May the 10th, 1995 at 7 p.m. You had a, your calendar reflects a meeting with Ambassador Lee, China meeting. Do you recall what that one was about? That is the same name, Ambassador Lee, as the then Ambassador Lee for, for the United States from People's Republic of China. That's a different Ambassador Lee. Okay, but do you know what that meeting was about? Yes, I was uh, advised by Committee 100. There was uh, Ambassador Lee. He used to be the ambassador for China to Nepal. Temporarily, uh, at that time, was visiting the United States, the various country. He, since he was uh, coming over to uh, Washington, they asked me whether I can just uh, extend a courtesy to meet with him and have a dinner okay. with him. On September the 21st at 9.30 a.m., your calendar reflects Chinese Delegation, Chinese State Planning Commission. What was that meeting? Chinese Delegation, Chinese State Planning Commission. I could not explain for sure right now. I did meet with some of the Chinese delegations. People made an arrangement to come over to see me, so I offered to, you know, to meet with them. I know, but the point is you had no responsibilities to deal with the Chinese government or Chinese people. And here you have a, an official delegation coming over, and uh, you, you met with them. You don't recall what it was about. It was not really an official delegation, probably, at that time. Chinese. Oh, say that again. I'm sorry. Sorry, one, one more time. Excuse me. Uh, I remember now. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there was a delegation visit Commerce Department. They would like to know how the Commerce Department's organization is. Uh, I was not the only one being asked to, to meet with them. Uh, I believe there was a Deputy Undersecretary for the, for the Economic and Statistics also was there trying to introduce the organization of the Commerce Department. And it was uh, done in the Commerce uh, Large Conference call, uh, Hall, and I was there. Okay, on October the 12th, you took a taxi cab to the residence of the Chinese ambassador. Do you know what you went over there for? And I was in, invited by... Uh, A friend of mine who is the head of a U.S. Institute, not U.S. Institute, Asian Institute, uh, to go over there to see what he was doing. And he was inviting a lot of American businessmen to go over there to the ambassador. That ambassador was actually the deputy of the mission, was not really the chief uh, at that time. And uh, just have a breakfast there. Do you know what you talked about? Yes, I do. What did you talk about? I did not really say very much. I was asked to confirm those questions at that time. Uh, apparently, the Exim Bank, at that particular moment, disapproved the loan for the financing of the Three Gorge project in China. Mm -hmm. And I was asked, uh, you know, whether I have any opinion on that. So you know, what did you say? They said, they said it's an off-record basis. <laughs> Mr. Wang, can you, can you, express your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. But you had nothing to do with uh, that uh, issue at the Commerce Department? No, I did not. But they were asking your opinion nevertheless. That's correct. Mm -hmm. While you were at the Commerce, uh, you met with uh, Tian Ming Wang, Minister of Counselor Commercial Affairs. Wang stated that he had known the PRC Minister Wang uh, since uh, 1972. Wang sought out Wang for personal advice, he says. He was retiring, wanted to know if Wang could get him a job in the private sector. Do you recall that meeting? Yes, I do. And what was that about? Basically, he was facing retirement age. He asked me whether, since I came on from a private sector and also I know some of the groups in Asia, whether I can you know, have any idea for him to continue his uh, you know, career. It's a personal basis. 
at any of these uh, receptions or dinners or anything, did you discuss anything of an official nature at all? No, except I was, you know, it's not on the official capacity, not a, not a not, government I'm business. I'm not asking that. Did you discuss anything of an official nature at all? No, sir. Were you ever told uh, specifically that you were to be walled off from any China issues at the Department of Commerce? I did not know. I learned this later on. I found out from news account. Well, Under Secretary Garten stated, well, generally, I didn't want Wong working on anything uh, regarding China. And since China was such a high priority, there was no chance that, with my knowledge, he would have gotten close to it. So they, they expected you to stay away from the Chinese issues at the Department of Commerce, and yet you met on a regular basis or frequently with people from the Chinese government and the Chinese embassy. Why was that? No, I, I visit the Chinese embassy based on a by invitation, okay? The reason I did not have a territory is when Mr. Garden came into the Department of Commerce much earlier, already took all those uh, functions from Mr. Chuck Meisner, which was, who was my assistant secretary for, for my unit. You went to the International Tr uh, Trade uh, Administration. Did you notify anyone uh, in ITA that you would be attending uh, this event? Let's see which event we're talking about. Is this the January 19th dinner? Did he notify that he worked for IT? Did you notify anybody at the ITA uh, that you were going to any of these events? You, you're talking about the, all the events you were talking about? Any of those events. The International Trade uh, Administration. What, did you tell them that you were going to these events over at the Chinese Embassy and meeting with those people? I didn't believe so. Weren't you supposed to do that? Weren't you required uh, to do that? I thought there was many of them as a social invitation. Every, every now and then would receive those invitations were going. Were you authorized in any way to discuss any commerce policies relating to China? I did not discuss any policy with China. Well, we have a whole list of meetings here with Ambassador Lee and, and a whole host of people. I have pages and pages and pages of them. And uh, it appears as though they wouldn't, uh, weren't all social events. Some of them were lunches or dinners with individuals. Uh, and these were all social. Principally, those are, as what you pointed out to me uh, just now. In your, you had an interview uh, with the task force you described in uh, May of 1995, breakfast with Zhao Wenzhong. Uh, Mr. Zhao was an official to Chinese embassy, isn't that right? Yes, that's the one you were referring on the taxi fare. Uh -huh. That was, I believe that was related to that. Did you talk about anything officially at that time? No, except I just reported to you, you know, as my, my comment. Some about the, that project in China? Yeah, the, the Three Gorge project. How was that project funded? I don't know. That, Did that's, the Department of Commerce have anything to do with that project? I don't think so. Did Lippo Group companies or partners have any interest in the Three Gorge project? No, sir. Not that I know of, sir. Yeah, I don't believe so either. Did you have any other meetings uh, that you haven't reported with Chinese officials other than, you know, what we've, what we've gone into here? Certainly, I don't recall. If I, I recall any, I'll definitely report to you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to have a list of those if we could get those issues. If, if I remember. No. Okay. Who do we have next? Mr. Shays. I'll yield my time to uh, Mr. LaCharette. Thank you very much, Mr. Shays. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Wong, there was a movie a couple of years ago called Groundhog's Day with 
And there was a, an actor, Bill Murray, and I think Andy McDowell. They kept coming back to this day in February and revisiting it. And I apologize to you, but we're just going to finish this uh, business on February the 19th, 1996, if I can. And I was interested, just a, an aside about what a small world it is. I had the chance to be in China a few years ago and, uh, with the Transportation Committee. We wanted to visit the Three Gorges Project because it's an amazing thing, not only in, in what it's going to represent for hydroelectricity for China, but I was also fascinated with the fact that a government could forcibly move a million people to from one place to another and but the speaker the former speaker of the house had just been over in that part of the world and he had made some uh, remarks that were interpreted to be supportive of Taiwan and so the Chinese government canceled our plane from Beijing to Xi'an where I, I understand we would have seen the project but I'm sure it's coming along nicely the people have been relocated and it's going to be a, a really nice dam someday but uh, going back to February the 19th um, I have two more contributions that I want to talk to you about, and then I want to sort of wrap up what happened on the, on the 19th. Thank you. And uh, there, there was a $12,500 contribution by an individual by the name of Charles Chang, uh, again, dated, uh, and if we could put up Exhibit 337, maybe, if you could refer to that and put it on the screen. And I, I would ask you, first of all, are, are you acquainted with the, an individual by the name of Charles Chang? May I, may I take a look at it? Sure. Congressman. If this is Charlie Chan, the same Charlie Chan as I know he, then I know him. Uh, I'm going to say the Charlie Chan of uh, the Chinese restaurant owner. I, I, I believe he's associated with, with Mr. Tree is, is the best connection. That, did you, do you know a Charles Chang that is connected with Mr. Tree? The only Tree? Charles Chan, there's a restaurant, quite a few Chinese restaurants, a Charlie Chan's uh, restaurant. Okay. Well, in this particular instance, this $12,500 check that was given uh, for the event on the 19th of February, Mr. Chang has indicated to us that he received uh, $6,500 directly back in a check from Mr. Tree, and then $6,000 in those traveler's checks that I showed you the other day. Were you, were you aware of that before I just said that? I was not aware of that. Okay. Likewise, uh, the next exhibit, it would be the page after number 338, uh, is a, a 20 $5,000 contribution from an individual by the name of Jack Ho. Uh, are you, were you an, uh, acquainted with Mr. Ho before this uh, event? I was not. And the, the contribution actually is from a, a, a business called J&M International. Did you know anything about that business, J&M International? No, sir. That day? Mr. Uh, we have, uh, again, the information is that a $25,000 contribution was returned to Mr. Ho and these uh, traveler's checks that came from Jakarta, uh, or, excuse me, from Macau. Um, I, were you f aware of that at any time before I just said it? No, sir. Okay. To, to wrap up then, I, I don't, you know, I, I haven't been keeping a running total, but uh, I think that we have talked about the fact that included in the money, the, the, did you raise a million dollars on the 19th of February? No. And how much did you raise, do you remember? My recollection is probably 800 and some thousand at that time. Okay. Of the 800 and some thousand dollars, I think that we, you and I have gone through uh, over the last couple of days close to $200,000 of money that, that is interesting, if, if, to say the least, and, and interesting in its connection to Mr. Charlie Tree. Uh, we talked about the fact that a woman who makes $25,000 gave $12,500. We've talked about a, a woman who uh, wrote a check on a starter check. We've talked about a couple of checks that were drawn on foreign businesses uh, to the tune of uh, 12500 in one case and $25,000 in another case. And, and I guess at, at the end of it, and we, we know today in the list of names that I went over with you uh, earlier in the, uh, in the hearing, we know today that a number of illegal contributions were received for the benefit of the Democratic National Committee as a result of that February the 19th, 1996 fundraiser. Do we not? Not, not that you knew that they were illegal when you accepted them, but, but yes. I think it's safe to say that close to two, I mean, we can quibble whether it's 190000 or two hundred, but close to $200,000 of that money at least, from just from what we've been talking about, were illegal contributions, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, 
I'm curious as, as to what sort of debriefing then takes place after one of these events, or didn't, in 1996. And, and I want to ask you if you had a meeting uh, after the event uh, with a fellow by the name of uh, Joe Sandler. Joe yes. Sandler. Oh, yes. And who, who, for the record, is Joe Sandler? He was the general counsel for DNC. Okay. And what was the purpose of the meeting? Uh, that was, a, as you indicated, that was my first uh, fundraising event. And I was told by then the finance director, Mr. Sullivan, Richard Sullivan, and said, then go over to see Mr. Joe Sandler. Mr. Sandler essentially want to see when we bring all the checks I collected and let him review it. And, and did you do that? Yes. At, at that meeting, did, did Mr. Sandler ask any questions about the checks? He asked me about individual checks, as whether you, you know about these people, if he has any questions. For instance, the question in general, I said, is he the U.S. citizen? you know of, it has a permanent residency. Yeah. If it's a corporate check, he says it's a U.S. company, has a U.S. revenue, you know, things like that. In okay. some instances, I did not know, and I'll go back to find out to answer to him. Well, how many checks, do, roughly, would you say you collected for this event? Um, I, I don't know the, the exactly numbers right now. It, it, it would be less than a 1,000, wouldn't it? I mean, it would... Oh, definitely less okay. than that. And he went through, as I understood what you just said, he would go through this pile of checks, and if he had a question, he'd ask you a question. Uh, or if you had something to say, you'd say something about That's it. That's correct. Okay. And, and the question's focused on whether or not the contributor was a U.S. citizen or a legal resident. That's correct. A and also, if it was a corporate contributor that had an address outside of the United States, whether or not this business had sufficient U.S. profits to cover the cost of the donation. Those would be typical of the questions that were asked. Uh, I don't specifically recall that he asked to say this. the company has a foreign address on the check. Uh, during this, uh, and I never knew the word vetting until I came to Washington, D.C., but I think we call that vetting checks. Right. During this vetting process that you had with Mr. Sandler, were any of the illegal contributions, close to $200,000 in contributions illegally obtained or, or given at that event, uh, were any of the, uh, those identified during this meeting with you and Mr. Sandler? No, sir, not in that event. In response to his questions, if he would ask you, for instance, is this person a United States citizen, uh, and you did not know the answer, what process or steps did you go through to get him the information if, and get back to him? If that was a question being asked, I, if I know for sure about the, the contributor, and I'll answer directly. If not, and I'll find out who actually is the solicitor, and I will go to ask them. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I see that my yielded time has uh, expired. I uh, would yield my time to Mr. Latourette. Thank you, Mr. Satter. I, I just want to f finish this line of questioning because I, it, it, I, I've heard you say over the last couple of days that uh, you didn't know that, that certain contributions were illegal. I think, you know, when Mr. Waxman was saying what's suspected and what's proven, what's proven today is that a number of these contributions at this event were illegal. They were given by people that weren't qualified to make contributions to, to uh, political uh, parties in, in this country for a variety of reasons. Uh, so that, that, I think, is proven. And if anybody disagrees with me, I guess they can, they can take it up with us a little bit later. Uh, but it, it, this process, there's two ways that you can approach that. I mean, you can say, I didn't know, uh, which you have said. You can also say, nobody ever did anything to try and find out, uh, sort of the, the political uh, contributing equivalent of don't ask, don't tell. I mean, I have a check. Uh, yep, it looks like a starter check. Yep, I know it came from a woman who only makes 25. But if I don't ask the questions as to whether or not this person's a U.S. citizen or if this is a, a U.S. corporation or this is a foreign company that has sufficient U.S. profit, then I guess we'll never know uh, whether or not um, um, contributions are obtained <laughs> illegally. Earlier, you, 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 when somebody was asking you about uh, you have to f uh, fill out on some of these uh, FEC forms where a person works, uh, and, and if you can't find it out, for instance, you put best efforts, is the, I think the, what your lawyer told you, 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 we put best efforts in that instance. C can you describe to the committee what the best efforts were uh, by you as a, and you were, a, a, what, a vice chair of the finance uh, department of the, of the Democratic National Committee. What best efforts did you put forth in vetting these checks from the February 19th, 19, 1996 fundraiser uh, as to whether or not these were contributions that could be legally obtained by a major political party in this country? 
I recall when I did in the event I did not have any address, I tried to find out the address because most of these people were individual. That was the information I tried to complete as much as I could but on the check, check tracking form. Okay, but but aside from the address, the, the, where these people lived isn't the problem. That the problem with these contributions is that they were conduit contributions. They were made by people who couldn't make them lawfully. They were made by, with money that came from foreign countries uh, in, in violation of our laws. What best efforts did you use to determine? Today we know that one quarter of the money that you raised, at least, and then maybe I don't, maybe I don't quite have the the, the, the the stuff down, but just from the questions you and I have talked about over the last two days, 25% of the money that you raised at this event was illegal, couldn't have been given. I, I'm interested to know what you did as a high-ranking official in the Democratic National Committee uh, to vet these checks to, to determine whether or not what we know today you could have decided back in 1996 and given the money back. And, and just so you don't think I'm, I'm picking on on the Democratic National Committee. I, I think this is an important thing uh, because th there needs to be, as Mr. Shays and Mr. Waxman and the rest of the Congress looks at our, lo our campaign finance laws, obviously we have, to, we have to punish and prosecute people as you have uh, been punished and prosecuted for violating the laws we have today. But, but I, I can't believe that, that we can just have a system in this country where you say, well, we're going to rake in a bunch of cash at a fundraiser, and, and if we don't ask the right questions, then come catch us to figure out if they were legal contributions or, or illegal contributions. So, so what responsibility did you take and, and did this Joe Sandler take to determine as to as, you know, one out of every four checks you got was bad? What did you do about it? What did you try to do about it to find out if, uh, if people could give money? Congressman. Yes, sir. As I reported to you, I, I did later on spot two of the checks that I just reported to you, which I found out was not proper. And I also vetted those checks with the general counsel, Joe Sandler, you know, whatever the checks I had at the time and gave it to me. And I filled out the check trafficking form, you know, to the best that I can. Uh, right, I could. Afterwards, I whatever the process I did not know. I did not really do personally, you know, further on that. Okay. Well, the, the check, one of the checks we talked about that came from the, the partnership that Mr. Tree was involved in uh, with Mr. Ng uh, <coughs> came in on the 29th, uh, 10 days after the event. Are you talking about the Daihatsu? I am. Yeah, okay. And, and that particular check, was that given to you after your, or before your meeting with Mr. Sandler? I believe that was after. Yeah. After. And, and there's an example of, I mean, today we know that Charlie Tree got that money from Mr. Ng. Uh, I mean, that, that, again, is one of those proven things. It's not one of those out there in the air, maybe, could be. We know that based upon the bank records. We know that that's an illegal contribution. I, I'm interested to know, since that came after the vetting meeting that you had with the general counsel of the Democratic National Committee, what did you do as a vice chair of the DNC to, to check that check out? What did you do? I did not check out because Daihatsu was uh, Mr. Charlie Tree's business. Mr. Charlie Tree is already being very established in the DNC. Was a fundraiser, you know, fundraiser before. I did not really make any further checking on that. Thank you very much, and I, I appreciate uh, the yielding of time. The gentleman has his own time now. If you'd like to use it, I'd, I'd be happy to claim my own time and, and yield it to my good friend, Mr. Osi. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Wong, I am particularly interested in the events surrounding two particular fundraisers, the first being on November 2nd of 95, and the second being, pardon me while I turn my page here, mm -hmm. the uh, events surrounding a fundraiser for Congressman Jackson. The questions I have deal, uh, I just want to run through a couple questions I have. Do you recall the event of November 2nd, 1995? Uh, it's an Asian Pacific American event at the Mayflower Hotel with Vice President Gore. Yes, I do, sir. Who was the first person to tell you about that event? 
I believe was the director of the uh, DNC, uh, for Asian Pacific American Affairs of DNC. I think it's Mona Pasqua. And when, and when did that, do you recall when that conversation took place? Um, when you and Ms. Pasquale? <coughs> Could be over the phone and, and also we, we also had a meeting in the offsite had lunch together later on. Generally, would that have been in September of 95? I would tend to think probably if it were the September or could be late September, most likely it would be early October, I think. This uh, Asian Pacific American event, what was the format or the context of that event? The, essentially, they try to form the, if I can best understood, understand it, is the, is the Asian American community would, would like to under the DNC would have formulated such a council. So hopefully you can, uh, particularly working on the Asian Pacific American issues and the raising money through the Asian American community. Was this a lunch and a dinner or just a lunch or just a dinner? I believe that event, Congressman, was a, was a dinner. And the solicitation that was made for attending the dinner was X number of dollars or what? My best recollection was uh, ten thousand dollars a head. So if you wanted to at come least to a target on that basis, sir. So the the approach was that if you wanted to join the Asian Pacific Council and attend this dinner, you had to write a check for ten thousand dollars. That is correct, basically. And the beneficiary of the ten thousand dollar contribution was, I believe, was the DNC. Who, and, and you told me that, now you suggested it, I want to make sure I understood who was organizing the event for the DNC. Was that Mona Pasquale? She was at least one of them. There were some other people as well uh, in helping out. Do you uh, recall who they were? It could be Sam Newman was another one. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Mercer's also tried in helping out. Now, uh, Clear, are you, you're familiar with the event. Did you help Ms. Pasquale at the event in terms of setting it up or in any? Oh, no, not in terms of setting up. Um, she and I are lunching and trying to, you know, give my opinion how she might be able to, to work on that. And what kind of help or what kind of uh, questions was she asking? Now, she, she had that was her first position in doing this. This was going to be the first event for Asian Pacific American at that time. And uh, I did not want, personally as a, a member of Asian American community, I did not want to see that things failed and look very bad. In particularly, I did not want to see uh, our, our congressional leader, which is Mr. Matsui, look bad either on that part. What kind of... Uh suggestions did you make? I mean, I, c I can understand the advice that she was seeking from you. I mean, that makes, that's perfectly logical. Uh, what type of help did she ask you for? You know, re for instance, the most specific, referring some of the names to her, you know, she might be able to contact. Identifying people that she could contact that's to correct. either attend or and or contribute money to the cause. That, that is correct, sir. Okay. Was anyone else at the lunch? No, that was dinner, Mr. Excuse me. No. Oh, yeah. Between you and Ms. Pasquale, oh, yeah, I'm lunch sorry. or dinner? That was lunch. Was it Sam Newman? Was there too. Sam Newman was there? Okay. And is Mr. Newman a fundraiser for the DNC? I believe he was at that time, yes. Okay. And this is late September or early October of 95? That is correct. Okay. Did you have a private conversation with Ms. Pasquale at that luncheon where you asked Mr. Newman to excuse yourself, excuse himself? I did. Okay. Why was that? Ms. Pasquale apparently running some difficulty in, in working around the Asian Pacific American communities. So that's why I encouraged her more or less, giving her some general advice into working with the community. For, for what purpose was Mr. Newman asked to leave 
that particular portion of the conversation? That was basically a very personal matter. That was also the first, I believe, was the first uh, first time that the uh, Ms. Pasquale was able to was was working at the uh, DNC for this particular event, uh, particular role, rather. Okay. After Mr. Newman left, what did you and she discuss? I don't know specifically. I basically trying to encourage her, you know, to work around, and it's very hard to work around our community. You know, you, you, you lump Asian Pacific American community as one. Actually, there are Japanese, Korean, you know, Chinese, even among Chinese, there are different, different groups, let alone to talk about Indo-Chinese and Indians, all these things, getting very complicated. Mr. Chairman, I see that the time that well, Mr. Mr. LaTourette uh, yielded. Chairman, uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent the gentleman be given five additional minutes. I don't want him to be interrupted in the middle of his. Uh, uh, that would be Mr. La Tourette getting an additional five. I haven't yet claimed my own time. Are we on my time now? No, would I, you I, need five more minutes right now? Uh, Whatever time it is, it. I'm asking that you be given it. All right. Without <laughs> objection. I appreciate, your, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. After Mr. Uh, Newman left, you talked with Ms. Pasquale about a number of things. Did you talk about fundraising specifically? No. I don't recall it specifically, except I mentioned to you, you know, along the line I refer some names. But essentially, Ms. Pasquale was encountered some difficulty in doing the job. And she was appointed a tears. I offer, most, most of the time I offer some encouragement, you know, to her. Were you in effect, I'm a little bit curious about this, did you kind of play a mentor role there with Ms. Pasquale? Or? I would never take that, that role. Sir, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm the man of unworthy. <laughs> I will not claim I'm a mentor for anybody. I'm learning things every day, sir. Did David Mercer uh, ask you to help on out for this event on November 2nd? Not at that particular time. Are you talking about that meeting? No. Yes. He was not at the lunch with Ms. Pasquale or Ms. No, Pasquale. sir. Okay. But he... At that time, he had not asked you to help with the event scheduled for November 2nd? No, at that period of time, no. You suggest that he subsequently did contact you about it? it getting, when the events are getting very close, the, the number did not come with the expectation. I did receive a call from Mr. Mercer. He said, John, you've got to be able to gotta come out and you know, help a little bit, meaning it's uh, help out giving some more names or something, give more encouragement to some of the people I know. Okay, so you, Mercer calls you, says we need your particular expertise here within the Asian Pacific community further than what we have to date. And part of that role was to identify other individuals, for instance, who might be able to attend the dinner and contribute the money. Is that correct? That's basically correct. However, the name's already been known to the DNC. It's already there. It just the responses did not come. Okay. The positive responses did not come yet. That, that really leads, I mean, I've, I've found that if you have the right person asking the right question at the right uh, time, you get a different answer than having the wrong person ask the right question at the right time. And what I'm curious about is, from a comparative sense, relative to Ms. Pasquale asking individuals to contribute, was she the wrong person asking the right question at the right time compared with you asking the same question of the right person at the right time? I mean, were, you, were you closing these deals, so to speak? No, that was not a situation to close deal. She had made some success already. You know, I just say, need more numbers. And you were brought in to help increase the numbers? Well, you increase the encouragement to more people to, to firm up. If I understand correctly, Mr. Mercer and Mr. Newman concluded separately that Ms. Pasquale's efforts, however noteworthy, were just not sufficient for this particular event. And then they approached you for additional assistance. 
Yes, I was getting a call from him, yes, for this. Did anyone else from the DNC contact you about this event? I could not recall right now, Congressman, Ex uh, except the Sam Newman, you know, the, the person I mentioned earlier. Who was at the lunch with Ms. Pasquale? That is correct, sir. Did you contact anyone about this event? I did. And who might that have been? The one I can remember more clearly was a, it's a lady called Chan Lo. Uh, I believe she was in San Francisco at that time. She's an American citizen? I believe she was, yes. Okay. Well, I mean, if she was, I hope she still is, so. Yeah, she is. Okay. Did you talk to uh, Charlie Tree about I this? I did event? also. And what did you ask Charlie Tree, if anything, to do regarding this November 2nd? I said this is the first one kick event, and hopefully everybody can help out, you know. Did you ask Mr. Tree to contact some others regarding this event? Specific people? Not specific, probably. If there were any specific people I, I mentioned about, probably it would be Charlie Chan. You know, the, the name was mentioned, the restaurant tour, whom I happen to know him because Charlie also uh, graduated from the same high school as I am, but he was much closer to Charlie Tree. You know, I may, may have referred to bring some people like Charlie or some other people to come in. Did you speak with, or did you contact Pauline Kanchanilak? I did also. Regarding this event? Yeah. Okay. Now, Mr. Congressman, let me clarify certain things. The event later on did not really come up with a lot of numbers, but somehow, in order to fill up the around the over table in the rooms, I recommend and say, well, to invite some of the people who's already making contribution to DNC in the past to join for the for the uh, dinner. Okay. The Pauline Kanchana was one of them. I believe Charlie was also one of them. Yeah. And he and Mr. Tree did attend the dinner. I believe he did. Yes. Okay. Going back to Chong Lo, what did you ask her to do for the event? I asked her to, you know, to to support. She was already known as a Good fundraising, good fundraising among Democratic circle in the past. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired. I ask unanimous consent if the de gentleman wishes additional time to pursue his inquiry that he get another five minutes. I again thank my good friend from California. What uh, what did you ask Pauline Kanchanlak to do? Just to attend the dinner? Please just I asked her to attend. Yes. Did she attend the dinner? She did. Did she do anything else besides, did she sell tickets? Did she identify no. additional people? For that particular event, she did not. I, I don't know whether she did. I don't think so, though. All right. Do you know uh, Ramesh Kapoor? I know of the person who's from the Indian community. OK, regarding this November 2nd event, did you contact him regarding the event? I don't believe so, though, sir. How about George Chang? George Chen is the one from the Taiwanese community in the uh, in the Virginia. Is the one we're talking about, sir? If that same one, I did not. Yeah, he he has been make. If I can re recollect that he had been active in the in the circle also. Okay. How about George Chaudry? George. But Dr. and Mrs. George Chaudry, I should say. Were they part of the people that you talked with about this event? Is that one from New York? Is it from Indian community as well? It's clearly Indian, yes. No. Okay, how about Paresh Shah? No. Asha Putli? No. Teddy Chan? Was she on your list? Teddy Chan. Is the last name C-H-A-N? Yes. No, not for me, no. Bailey Tom? Yes. Okay. Ashok Bhatt? No. David Kim? No. Sant Chanwal? No. Kaz Nakagawa? I don't think so, no. No. How about Howard Hong? Not from me, although I know Howard. Yeah. Okay. How about Jelly Borromeo? 
Or I know her, but not for me, no. Okay. Sharon Singh? Not for me, no. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to... I would like to go in a little bit of a different direction. You, you were, at this point, you were in the Department of Commerce for... When did you... I know someone asked you this question earlier. You actually started your employment at the Department of Commerce when? In July 18, 1994. Uh, 1994, I'm talking. 1994. When I came to Congress, I had a number of briefings about what I could or couldn't do as a member of Congress. Does the Department of Commerce offer that to, to their employees relative to either the Hatch Act, uh, political behavior, or ethics? There was a memo coming to me, yes, for that. Okay. So you, d you did receive some advisement from the Department of Commerce as to what you could or couldn't do? That's correct. Now, I, know, I noticed that you had a meeting with Harold Ickes on regarding the November, uh, I think the November 2nd event. Is that correct? Or am I remembering incorrectly? Sorry. Congressman, can you repeat that again, please, sir? Okay. All right. I stand corrected. Let me rephrase my question. Uh, did you have a discussion with Harold Ickes during the time of your employment at the Department of Commerce regarding a campaign by Jesse Jackson, Jr.? Yes, I did. What was the substance of that conversation with Mr. Ickes? Now, the key thing, Congressman, the conversation was purposeful for other matter, but this particular thing came, came about during that phone conversation. Uh, I cannot really repeat exactly words, but I can give you the, the general gist of that. What was the substance of that telephone conversation? He's, he said, can you... Can you uh, to see if I could do something, you no, know, do something in the Asian American community and come out with a ten or fifteen thousand dollars for Mr. Jackson's campaign. At this time, where Mr. Ickes was at the DNC at this time? No, he, I believe he was uh, at the White House, the deputy uh, uh, chief of staff. So the. Deputy Chief of Staff, well, let me, let me refer, ask the question differently. Did you call Mr. Ickes or did Mr. Ickes call you? That is a call, as I said, that the subject was for some of the originally purpose for something else, but this thing came about during the conversation. Yeah. Did you call him or did I did not call him, but he called me on that. He called you. That's right. Okay. The, the thing that I'm curious about is that it, the deputy chief of staff, well, where did he call you from? He called you from the White House? Is that what I heard you <coughs> say a few moments ago? I don't know where he exactly called me, but I assume that he's calling me from the White House. Okay. Well, I'm not going to make that assumption. I am kind of curious, but uh, so the deputy chief of staff at the White House calls you during the term of your employment at the Department of Commerce. Did he call you at your Commerce office? That's correct. So you were in a federal position at that time, and he asked you to assist with fundraising in a congressional campaign. That's a question, I should say. It's not a statement. That's a question. <coughs> Did he ask you to assist at that time with fundraising Excuse me, one payment. second. Mr. Chairman, I notice the gentleman's time has expired, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent be, he be given an additional five minutes to continue his uh, inquiry. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Axman. The uh, Congressman, to answer your questions, yes, he did. From your understanding of the briefing when you first went to work at the Department of Commerce or the ethics memos that might have otherwise come, is that an allowed activity? He, my understanding was that he was not asked me to give contribution. He asked me, you know, to, to find out whether the Asian community can do that. I was willing to help at that time. 
So he called to ask you to solicit support within the Asian American community rather than ask you for a contribution directly. Mm, not really solicit to, to find out from the community whether they can come out with something. Because I'm, I am from Asian American community. The perception was to, I might have known somebody might be able to do something. Well, I'm a little confused now. Let me back up a little bit. The Deputy Chief of Staff calls you in your Department of Commerce office and asks you to identify, talk to, visit with members of the Asian Pacific community about fundraising? I mean, I'm, I'm, un I'm unclear on the concept here about what this particular well, portion of the discussion Congressman, let me put down the, to the to the point where I did not feel comfortable. I didn't probably that was wrong to do that. Okay, that's a nutshell for that. But I was not sure on that. Well, I, number one, I, I, I appreciate you saying that because I do have a copy of the Hatch Act here. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to ask Mr. Ickes the same question. But I just, I'm just trying to understand, I mean, at the congressional level, the sanctions are pretty severe as to someone in my office or me engaging in that kind of an activity, which you might say is, has a rather significantly high smudge factor, it's kind of indeterminate, uh, to do that out of my congressional office. And I'm trying to understand how it is that, in your case, in this conversation with Mr. Ickes, that you could ever have gotten this far on telephone or in person, sitting in your Department of Commerce office, especially having had the training from the memos and, the, and what have you, from your personal testimony, and certainly Mr. Ickes having enjoyed the same benefit. No, I did not understand. Could you repeat the question? Sorry about this. Somebody calls me up and says, Sir. you know, I want you to do this, that, or the other thing. And it's vague. Uh, I mean, I understand what they're asking me to do, but they're purposely vague about the specifics. Well, frankly, I understand the law from the uh, briefings and memorandums that have been given to me as a member of Congress, what I can and can't do. And clearly, you at least now understand the import of those things. I'm just trying to understand where Mr. Ickes was coming from and what light you can shed on where what his perspective was regarding that same activity. Because if it's, if it's not appropriate for you to do it as it, from your Department of Commerce office, it certainly seems inappropriate for the deputy chief of staff at the White House to ask you to do do something inappropriate. I expressed my feeling you know, it was not proper. I don't know what Mr. Ickes is feeling at that time. When, uh, after the conversation, did you follow up on what Mr. Ickes asked you to do? I did. I did not really do it immediately, though. So and Later on, it did, it did come through. I did, did do something. And the result of the, we're not going to use the word solicitation because you're not comfortable with that. I might use that, but you're not comfortable with it. But the contacts you made subsequent to that call resulted in some benefit to Congressman Jackson, then candidate Jackson's campaign. That is correct. I have to think about this, Mr. Chairman. Can I come, can we come back on the next round? I yield back. Well, before you yield back, if you'd yield to me real briefly, Certainly. how much money did you uh, raise for Mr. Jackson's campaign? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, if I remember correctly, the total amount, including the money from my personally and my wife, is about seven thousand dollars. Seven thousand? Yes, sir. How much was from you and your wife? Uh, in total, about a thousand five hundred each. About three thousand. So you raised four. No. 1000 in total, 500 each. About $1,000. So you raised $6,000 from other sources. That's correct. 
Did you collect that money yourself? Did you get the checks? Yes, I did. Did you turn them over to the DNC or to Mr. Jackson's campaign? I delivered to the the office on the K Street somewhere. Uh, I believe that was related to Mr. Jackson's. When you did that, did you were you aware that you were violating the Hatch Act or possibly violating the Hatch Act? Mr. Chairman, I certainly did not feel very comfortable in doing that, but I did not know for sure that. When you, when you talked to Mr. Ickes, did you tell Mr. Ickes that you thought that this was something you should not do? I did not. What did Mr. Ickes say to you? He basically, as I... I know, but I want you to be a little bit more specific. What did he say, do you recall? He basically said, he said can you run up the, you know, Ten to fifteen thousand dollars from the Asian community for Mr. Jackson's campaign, and he, he said you need to be uh, be careful about this. Something Did, in that language, careful. He said, be careful about be it. Be sensitive about that. Be sensitive about it. What do you think he meant by be sensitive about the it? The reason that was a primary election. You know, there was a different candidates running for that seat. Uh, I can sense that probably you don't want to people know somebody is citing one against another. Uh, among the Democratic candidates. You don't think he meant, hey, you, you're, you're treading on the law and maybe you shouldn't be doing this? At least but, I did not think of it that way. But, but I, he my, could have meant that, couldn't he? Mm, my, I have no reason to believe that was the case, though, sir. Yeah. Okay. The gentleman can continue the next round, I guess. Well, Mr. That, Chairman, uh, if, if the members wouldn't mind, I'd like to take some of my five-minute round. I, I would yield to the gentleman from California. <laughs> oh, gentleman's entitled five to his five-minute round, and if he needs a little bit of extra time, we'll see if we can't accommodate him. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, yesterday I, I talked about the uh, issue about David Wang. David Wang was the gentleman that, to whom we gave immunity. <laughs> testified, and he said uh, after we gave him immunity that he, uh, Mr. Wong had come and given him money to pay for a contribution he had given to the Democrats. And then we at that time uh, established that Mr. Wong was not in Los Angeles, but in New York. And we established it, it seems to me very, very clearly that uh, Mr. Wang was not uh, accurate in his statement. Yet, even though this accusation has turned out to be false that Mr. Wang made against Mr. Wong, uh, no one, no one seems to be willing to admit that there was a mistake, that uh, there was an accusation that turned out to be unsubstantiated. Well, I want to show a video, if I might, uh, from CBS television. It was a news show. and exclusive information tonight about another high-profile legal case, this one centering on a key Democratic political campaign fundraiser and his possible leak of classified economic information to an Asian business connection. CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer is on the case. Investigators are closing in on John Wong, the one-time Democratic Party fundraiser and former Commerce Department official. Sources tell CBS News the government now has information collected by electronic eavesdropping devices, suggesting that while Wong was at the Commerce Department, he did pass on classified trade secrets and other information to his former employer, the Lippo Group, an international company with ties to China. House Rules Committee Chairman Gerald Solomon, who's been pushing the investigation, believes the new information may be the smoking gun investigators have been looking for. We believe that, uh, that the intercepts that we have show that Mr. Wang was uh, passing on classified information, uh, both dealing with economic espionage and, and breaches of national security, to a foreign corporation with connections to the Chinese government.
Attorney General Reno and FBI Director Free gave senators an early read on all this during an April visit to the Capitol. But Solomon has since learned that Wong's access to classified information went even deeper. In a letter to FBI Director Free, he says Wong not only saw Commerce Department trade secrets, but also had access to sensitive State Department message traffic through a computer network of the Commerce Department. As Solomon sees it, this is just one more reason to take the case out of the hands of Congress and the Justice Department and appoint a special prosecutor. Dan? Thanks, Bob. Chairman and my colleagues, that was uh, from April of uh, 97. Here it's December of 1999. We now have the 302s. Uh, that, uh, which mean the interviews by the FBI checking into some of these allegations. And I'd, I'd like to have distributed to other members the FBI interview notes with Representative Solomon who made these accusations. I think that's uh, going to be distributed. And I want to read from this interview with Mr. Solomon because the FBI wanted to find out what Mr. Solomon knew. And... Uh, he began the interview by stating that at no time has he ever been the recipient of classified information from the Department of Commerce. He tries to avoid receiving any type of classified information so that he's not hindered when speaking by a fear of revealing information that is classified. He added that all classified documents received by the House are directed to the House Committee on Intelligence. If there was something that he believed that he needed to review, he would go to the committee and review the information there. Then he then the FBI report said, at this point, Congressman Solomon advised that he did not have a copy of the article in question. Therefore, the relevant portion of the article was read to him as follows. And then they read back to him. I have received reports from government sources that say there are electronic intercepts, electronic intercepts which provide evidence confirming what I suspected all along, that John Wong committed economic espionage and breached our national security by passing classified information to his former employer, the Lippo Group. Congressman Solomon recalled that a Senate staffer at either a Senate or a House reception told him that he, the staffer, had received confirmation that a Department of Commerce employee had passed classified information to a foreign government. It was Congressman Solomon's understanding that the staffer meant John Wong that the information went to China. However, the staffer did not say that. Then they, that was what he said on August 28, 97. He also said that he could not recall the staffer's name, but he might recognize him if he saw him again. Well, then on February 25, 1998, the FBI further asked Mr. Solomon about this. And Congressman Solomon advised he does not know this individual's name and he has not seen him again. He advised that the statement by the Senate staffer was something to the effect that, Congressman, you might like to know that you were right. There was someone at Commerce giving out information. Congressman Solomon described this staffer as a male in his 30s or early 40s, approximately 5 foot, 10 inches tall, with brownish hair. This occurred in the hallway of the Rayburn Building while Congressman Solomon was either going to or returning from a reception. Now, I, I know uh, Jerry Solomon and consider him a friend, and I don't think he meant to hurt anybody particularly, but when you have an accusation like this made, it was on national television. The accusation was on the front page of the LA Times. And uh, what is the basis for this accusation? Basically, some unidentified person saying something to him at a reception, in or out of a reception in, in the Capitol. He doesn't remember the staffer, and he uh, doesn't have anything specific that ties Mr. Wong into anything along the lines of giving information from the Department of Commerce to China. I just, I just want to raise this to illustrate the fact that members of Congress should particularly, and everyone should feel some restraint in making allegations that are so inflammatory. The truth never quite catches up with the headlines. Mr. Wong 
has admitted yesterday and today that he committed what amounted to a felony in, in terms of giving a conduit campaign contribution. But he's denied all these other accusations that have had such widespread reporting, uh, reporting in the uh, in the major media for the last three years. And uh, where do you go to ever correct the record? Where do you go to point out that the accusations were, that were made just turned out not to have been true, not to have been substantiated? And it just seems to me that when accusations are made by members of Congress, for whatever reasons, including the fact that they may benefit a particular party politically by attacking President Clinton and his administration, that when you find out that the allegations had no substantiation, people ought to be willing to say they were wrong. I said yesterday, if it turns out that some of these accusations turn out to be true and we have evidence for them, I will admit that I was wrong. But I haven't heard anybody, the chairman or anybody else who's made these inflammatory ac accusations, uh, ever admit their error. Mr. Solomon maybe will want to do something about this now, although he's not in Congress anymore. But he did talk to the FBI on two separate occasions. And despite his inflammatory accusations of what hints at treason by Mr. Wong, pretty serious stuff, it turned out that it was gossip from somebody he didn't really know about somebody that wasn't clearly identified from an individual who was in his 30s or 40s that he saw outside going in or out of a cocktail party. I raise that point, and I think we ought to try to learn from it uh, uh, because we're supposed to be responsible people in the Congress of the United States, and I hope we would recognize our responsibility and take it seriously. I yield back to Mr. Mr. Chairman. Will the gentleman yield to me for just a second? Yes, I, I'd be happy to yield. Thank you very much. Because I, in the spirit of what you're saying, I, I, I would like to ask a question. Maybe you know, maybe the chairman knows. But uh, I've read the 302 that you were referring to and, and uh, Congressman Solomon or Chairman Solomon in the hallway with the staffer. But in his 302, he, he talks about the fact that <clears throat> his information may have also come from a, uh, an NBC uh, worldwide broadcast alert. And, and I had the chance to read that while you were we're talking. And, and the thing that's of interest to me is that the allegation that I saw uh, Congressman Solomon make on, on television was that this was information that was collected by United States listening uh, uh, stations. And according to this M NBC article, at least, uh, a staffer, again, familiar with intelligent matters, indicates that the, it was picked up at U.S. electronic eavesdropping sites targeted on Trans-Pacific Communications. And I, I remember yesterday when the chairman w was making observations about Senator Lieberman uh, as as well, had made some observations about classified information had been passed on concerning intelligence matters that, that were collected by these listening to I'm wondering, are, we, are those the same things or are those something else? Well, I don't know. Uh, we have heard reports and seen already in the press statements that there were uh, intelligence intercepts that, of discussions by people in the uh, People's Republic of China talking about how to try to influence the Congress and get more involved in uh, lobbying and whatever. We know uh, 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 about that report. But Mr. Solomon said that he, um, he had information from an intercept. That was, that was where his statements on that television, from an intercept, electronic intercept. Now, if Mr. Solomon, uh, he acknowledged, if if he were in receipt of electronically electronic intercepts, it would be a violation of national security laws to release that information to the press. And he um, said in, in this interview that he didn't have any, uh, any classified information from the Department of Commerce. And then he proudly told the FBI, I don't, uh, I, I try to avoid receiving any type of classified information so that he's not hindered when speaking by a fear of revealing information that is classified. And he said if, if he um, uh, were going to get classified information, he'd go to the Intelligence Committee. But the key point here is that Mr. Solomon, who made this allegation, might have been sincere in making it, but he apparently had no information. He was basing his allegation on gossip. And that's what's so disturbing to me. 
Will, will the gentleman yield further? I, I would just like to make a request of, of you as the ranking member and also the chairman. I, I, I think that <clears throat> I've heard Mr. Wong over the last couple of days indicate that this didn't happen. I think it's a very serious allegation. If, if, if there is, in fact, evidence in the control of the United States government that information was, and it's been picked up by our listening stations or our intelligence services or anybody else, uh, that an official within the Commerce Department was transferring classified information to uh, a foreign entity. I think that I think that is treason. And I, I would hope that understanding the issues of national security, but for crying out loud, if this was in fact happening, as Senator Lieberman apparently had some observations to make about it, Congressman Solomon's had some observations about it, I, I think that, that Mr. Wong should either be cleared or not clear. And, and I, I think that if we have the information, we have the tools and the ability and the power to get to the bottom of this. And if, I, if I can just respond to the gentleman, we've had briefings by the FBI, and they've checked into all of these uh, allegations, and there's not a, any evidence that the FBI has reported to us to indicate that these accusations have any basis in truth. And if there were a basis in truth, if we could establish these facts, then I would join with you in condemning them and expressing outrage. But what I'm expressing is outrage about the allegations that are made where there is no basis for those allegations that take a man's reputation that is not sterling, obviously, because he's committed a campaign finance violation and admitted guilt to a felony. But that doesn't justify accusing him, uh, him uh, on, based on gossip uh, of, of treason uh, uh, in selling out the uh, interest of, of the uh, United States uh, to, the, uh, re uh, to the Chinese government. If the gentleman would yield briefly. Yes, yes. Let me, let me just say that uh, uh, we quoted Senator Lieberman yesterday, and I'd like to refresh everybody's memory. It says, non-public, this is his quote, Non-public evidence presented to the committee demonstrates a continuing business intelligence relationship between the Riyadis and the People's Republic of China Intelligence Service. That does not mean Mr. Wang uh, necessarily, but the fact is there may be other intelligence gathering agencies that have some information that we could take a look at. We, w the, I will ask uh, uh, the staff to uh, assist me in checking into this to see if there is any verification. If there isn't, I agree with you that uh, that uh, that we ought to uh, uh, make sure that the record states that uh, that there is no evidence that Mr. Wong did that. But uh, in the meantime, before we take that step, uh, I will see if we can't contact the intelligence agencies to see if there's any verification of what Mr. Solomon or what Mr. Lieberman said. If you yield to me, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I think it, uh, and I'll be glad to work with you and have our staff sure. work with your staff to find out the truth. But if there were a connection between Mr. Riotti who has business in Indonesia and China and I don't know where else, and in his business activities over there, uh, he has any contact with the People's Republic of China and, uh, and, and, any, and, and their intelligence agencies or anything along those lines. What does that have to do with Mr. Wong? Well, he didn't, you know, unless you can show that Mr. Wong had some connection to it, it seems to me so grossly unfair to accuse him of treason no. based on gossip and connections between people who he worked for at one time and other activities that they might have had, uh, which haven't been established, but might be well, uh, uh, in terms of uh, some connection to um, the Rep People's Republic of China and their intelligence agents. Well, it's a gentleman yield. We, sure. will, we will check that out, and I'll look forward to working with you and your staff to see if we can't uh, clarify that as quickly as possible. If you're willing to, at that point, admit the error of some of the statements sure. that have been made, I think that's only fair, and I hope you would take in mind uh, the uh, fact that we did an injustice to Mr. Wong when we had Mr. Wang's statement that Mr. Wong went into his office and gave him a conduit contribution, and it turned out that Mr. Wong was in New York, and it, uh, it was someone else th uh, that had gone to uh, Mr. Wang was wrong. And Mr. Wang was wrong, and the accusations we made based on Mr. Wang's incorrect testimony should uh, 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 should be withdrawn as well, and I hope you would take that to heart. Well, I don't think Mr. Wang's testimony should be withdrawn uh, in total. If there was a mistake, that mistake should be corrected, but he was a conduit for at least $10,000, as you know, in illegal campaign he, contributions. He, he, he meaning who? Mr. Wang. 
He, Mr. He, Mr. Wang. Mr. Wang Mr. was a conduit. Mr. Wang. But he said he was a and, conduit for Mr. Wong. And, and the information that you stated to the committee, and I have not yet checked that out, was that instead of it being Mr. Wong, it was Charlie Tree. And you have stated, and I have not checked that, but we will, that uh, Charlie Tree has said in his 302s to the FBI that he was the one that uh, that uh, laundered that money through Mr. Wang. Now, if you, if you want to set the record straight, you'll also recall that your staff uh, tried to get uh, Mr. Wang's father to say things that were untrue, and that became a fiasco in the investigation as well. So I, I don't know that we want to go through that whole rigmarole again. All I can say is that we will check that out as well. If Charlie Tree was the one, as, as we have heard that it is from the 302s, we'll set that record straight as well. You, you've made some allusion to my staff, and I've checked out that accusation, and that's absolutely untrue. Well, not uh, according to the, the, to the attorney for Mr. Wang and for Mr. Wang's father. I, 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 I just tell you that it is untrue. But let us check the record on Mr. Wang. Mr. Wong has denied that he was there giving Mr. Wang the money. Charlie Tree has said that he's the one who's done it. So it was clear that Mr. Wang was mistaken, and that mistaken testimony by Mr. Wang became the basis for a very serious accusation by you, Mr. Chairman, against Mr. Wong that should be admitted uh, as incorrect now that we have further information. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Souter. Um, given the nature of this debate, I have an article I'd like to submit into the record to <clears throat> that relates to this general point. Mr. Solomon is not a member of, of this committee. Uh, I'm sorry for any wrong that was done to Mr. Wong from that. If indeed the evidence holds that up, he deserves an apology from Mr. Solomon and anybody else. One of the unfortunate byproducts of um, this investigation, because millions of Americans are outraged that our secrets got to China. We don't know who and how, and it is wrong for anybody, which Mr. Waxman is warning us, to jump to conclusions and say that about individuals until it's, it's proven. At the same time, uh, there's kind of an implication here that everybody involved in this has been jumping to conclusions. And the article I want to insert in the record, merely because it makes this point, is by James Ring Adams in the American Spectator, not necessarily known as the most cautious publication in America, uh, in December 1996, that says John Wong was the fall guy in the Indonesian scandal, was merely the errand boy of billionaire Asian interests with long-standing ties to the Clinton crowd. And he also says he was more of an errand boy than a prime mover. It says that he's being punished more than the politicians who received his illegal money. My point being is even those who have been very critical of this whole scandal since 1996 have not all maintained that John Wong is at the center of the universe with this. And I think it's important the record to show that people have been all over the place. Uh, what we're trying to do with these hearings today is to find out the actual facts. The purpose of the hearing is to get the facts out and get the truth out to the American people, and uh, we'll try to do that. And if the record's incorrect, we will correct it. Uh, who do we have next on the schedule? All right, it's, it's the chairman. All right, we'll go on to another. <sighs> Mr. Lantret, are you prepared? Uh, I, I understand that you wanted me to yield to you right now. I can get to my stuff uh, after a bit. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Lotteret. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Mr. Wong, I, I want to go into uh, another fundraising event that occurred on the 26th of uh, September in 1996. But before I do that, I, I was just this discussion that we've just been having with Mr. Waxman sort of jogged a, a memory, and, and that is <clears throat> during your opening statement, you indicated you made reference to Mr. Solomon's interview. I don't know if it was the one that we just uh, saw on CBS, but. They said you're, you had been advised that an anonymous source at a cocktail party turned out to be the source of Mr. Solomon's statements. And I, I, I didn't see, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Solomon's 302s from the FBI until they were just distributed. And I, I guess I'm wondering how you came to, to, to be in possession of that information. How, how did you know that Mr. Solomon said to the FBI that it was a, 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 a person at a cocktail party? I was advised by my attorney. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Sometime I'll ask your lawyer, I guess. I want to turn to the, uh, the 26th of, uh, of September. Well, I, I, think, I think that's pretty important because we have an FBI 302 that was not yet made public. And if the counsel for Mr. Wong was giving him information from an FBI 302 that was not made public, I think it's important to find out how he knew that. So uh, if with, with unanimous consent, I'd like to ask the counsel, I, Mr. Cobb, if, uh, how he knew about that 302. Is there an objection? Objection is not heard, Mr. Cobb? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer that question. I did not get the information from the 302. 
From where did you get it? I got it from the Campaign Finance Task Force. The campaign... During, during the course of Mr. Wong's interviews, the confusion about Mr. Solomon's statement was cleared up for us. In, in, in the hearing with the Campaign Finance Task Force, is that what you're saying? In the, yeah, in the, in the 20 days of interviews. So they, so they gave you that information during the interviews? Not, not in the detail as reflected in the 302. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. and thank you, uh, Mr. Cobb. And the, the other day I was wondering whether you gentlemen had represented Mr. Wong and his other stuff, and I saw you on TV, so you must have. And you, you again, are excellent lawyers, and you're to be commended. And if I ever get involved in this sort of thing, I'm going to call you, I think. Uh, the, the 26th of September, 1996, Mr. Wong, were you involved in that event? Uh, was that referred to the uh, Central Sheraton. City in Los Angeles? The Sheraton Carlton Hotel in Washington. There was a fundraiser at the Sheraton Carlton Hotel on the 26th of uh, September, 1996. Did you, you attended that, did you not? I think the date was not correct. If you're talking about Sheraton Carlton, it was not September 26th, though. What, what, day, what day do you think it was? You talking about in the May, maybe? July the 13th? I think it's May 13th. If May I'm the honest. 13th. Well, anyway, you know what? There was, there, a was one. The, there was a fundraiser at the Sheridan Carlton sometime in 1996. That, that was correct, yes. Okay. And uh, you attended that event? That's correct. Did you do work for that event, help raise money for that event? Yes, I organized that. I helped organize it. Okay. And, and uh, did Mr. Riotti, James Riotti, attend that event? Not, not that event, no. Okay. Congressman, yeah, we're trying to help you. Thank you. I'm supposed to help you anyway. So and I appreciate to it. the community and uh, uh, to the committee. Sheridan Carter has been hosting quite a lot of events for fundraising. You know, it could be really referring to one of the event, probably in Sheridan Carter that Mr. James Riotti did attend. Okay. Uh, in probably not the May the 13th one. Could be later on. Okay. Uh, could be what you're talking about the uh, July there's one on that. Okay, specifically the month of September. Do you recall an event at the Sheraton Carlton in Washington uh, where you were in attendance and Mr. Riotti was also in attendance? And the reason I ask you is that, right. that David Mercer of the DNC indicates that one of the last times that he saw okay. uh, Mr. Riotti was, was at this event with you. And that's all. I, I'm going to try and help you, too, with your memory. Thank you for, for helping me. We, we are really in line with the talking about specific right now. Yeah, Mr. Mercer ho organized and hosted that event. They're basically for the African American community. Okay, and and that was on September the 26th of That's 1996. Right. right, and it was at the Sheraton, Sheraton Carlton, Carlton Hotel. Yes, man, that took me about four minutes to get where I thought we were going to go originally. I uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the gentleman's still in the middle of his interrogation. I want to give him, uh, by unanimous consent, additional time. Uh, how about ten minutes? That'd be more than generous. Uh, I appreciate it. So, so if, if uh, I'll ask unanimous consent, the gentleman proceed for another ten minutes, but. Mr. Wong ought to be given an opportunity if he needs a break to take it now, otherwise we can nope. keep going. Uh, I, I don't, personally, I don't have any objection to continue. Okay, we'll, we'll continue for these 10 minutes, and then if you would like, we'll take a break then, uh, so you can have a few minutes just to right. uh, rest up, and then we'll come back. Thank you very much, Congressman. Yeah. Are you sure, Mr. Wong? I mean, I, I'm, I'm known for my withering examination, so if you want to take a, if you want to take a break ahead of time, go ahead. I'm totally surrendered with all the lawyers. I'm not a lawyer, as the Congressman Shea said. <laughs> I'm really in a disadvantaged position. All right. Well, we're at September the 26th, 1996. We're at the Sheraton Carlton in Washington, D.C. It's a fundraiser organized by David Mercer. Uh, primarily, you said, was an African-American event was the target audience. Uh, and you are there with Mr. Riotti. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, was Mr. Tree, Charlie Tree, also uh, in attendance at this event? I couldn't quite recall, but I don't believe he was there, though. Okay. It, I could not quite recall. That's okay. okay. I, all, all I want is your best, your best memory. Right. And no guesses. I, I want to uh, turn to the exhibit book, if you can, in Exhibit 501, 
uh, and maybe if we can put 501 up on the uh, on the screen as well for the the benefit of everybody else. Exhibit while while it's being uh, gotten out, 501 is a ticket from the Cary Limousine Company, uh, and uh, while I well, how I suspected you were in Washington on that day is that it indicates that you arranged for a limousine uh, on that day to go from the uh, Democratic National Committee headquarters to Dulles Airport, then to the Watergate South apartment. From there, the limousine, according to the ticket, uh, went on to the Sheraton Carlton, then back to the Watergate South. Uh, do, you, do you see all that and agree that I have the itinerary right for where that limousine went on that particular occasion? Yes, I may, yes. Okay, I, are you able to <clears throat> explain to us uh, well, then let me ask you a series of questions. Did, did you go uh, in that limousine to pick up James Riotti? I believe I did. At, uh, would that be the stop at Dulles Airport? I don't know what's... <clears throat> yes, I did. Okay, at, at, at Dulles. So the Dulles, Dulles, the yes. Dulles stop on the ticket would be picking up Mr. Riotti. That's right. It then went to the Watergate South, and the Watergate South is where Mr. Tree lived, is that correct? Charlie Tree lived at the Watergate, stayed at the Watergate? That is correct. Was the purpose of the limousine on the 26th of September to, to go pick up Mr. Tree next? No. Do you recall why it is you went, you directed the limousine to go to the Watergate South then on that day? I think Mr. Riotti was the, was the guest, uh, you know, to be invited to stay in there instead in the hotel by Mr. Tree. Well, okay. But the, according to the ticket, it leaves the Watergate, goes to Sheridan Carlton. So uh, if you picked up Mr. Riotti at the Dulles Airport, you then go to the Watergate South. I, I think that you picked up Mr. Tree and he got in the car and then you all went to the Sheridan Carlton. Is that what happened, or did something else? Why, why would you, if he's going to... I did not quite recall Mr. Tree went for that, that evening's event, or he came along with a limousine directly go to that event, though. If he did go, probably he went separately by himself. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but if it was your recollection that Mr. Riotti had been invited to stay with Mr. Tree at the Watergate? That is correct. Okay. So the stop at the Watergate could have been for Mr. Riotti to drop off luggage or freshen up or whatever before you, you headed over to the Sheraton Carlton? If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Riotti also stayed overnight in... At, at Mr. Least Tree's apartment. At Tree's apartment, mm -hmm. yes. Did, did you stay there as well that evening after the Sheraton Carlton? I might have, yes. Okay. I might have. But you might have, but you don't recall specifically. I don't recall specifically, okay. yes. That, that same exhibit indicates that the following morning uh, that you arranged for the, a limousine to pick someone up at the Watergate South at 715, but there was no response. Do you recall why it is that you made that arrangement? <coughs> Who was supposed to pick up, where it was supposed to go? We were on the right-hand side of the uh, yeah. lower bottom, sir. Uh-huh. I'm at the, uh, the lower right-hand side, Watergate, time arrived. Um, the best recollection, probably everybody overslept. One, one more time. Everybody's gone already? No, overslept. Oh, overslept. Okay. <laughs> now, now that we've talked about it and, and you think that maybe people were over, had overslept, did, do you have a recollection of spending the night at the Watergate with Mr. Riotti and Mr. Tree now? I mean, is this refreshing your memory that, that that's where you were? That's where yes. Mr. Riotti? That's yes, where you I were. Do. The right. three of you spent the evening at Mr. Tree's place at the Watergate South Apartments. Right. Okay. This uh, visit... Oh, hang on a minute. I, I want to go to exhibit number 502 next, if you could look at the next page. Uh, it's another limousine ticket for the 27th. It indicates that <clears throat> you, uh, someone was uh, taken from the Watergate to 14th and Pennsylvania Avenue, then to the Democratic National Committee, then to Connecticut and I Street, then back to 14th and Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, are you able to, to give us a, a, a reason as to why you hired a car for this purpose, who was in it, and what was going on?
But uh, let, let me. Let, at, at this moment, I could not. Okay. Let, let me ask you this: Do you know whether or not this limousine that we're now talking about in Exhibit 502 picked up anyone other than Charlie Tree at the Watergate? Um, Mr. Riali came in with another uh, uh, executive from Lippo as well. So there's only two persons involved in the limo, as best I can recollect. Okay. Do, do you know why it went to 14th and Pennsylvania Avenue? And, and specifically, the why was it to pick up Mark Middleton? Although I cannot really recollect exactly, you know, it, it might have been to visit Mr. Middleton. Mr. Middleton at that time already, I think it's 1996, right? September yeah, the 26th. Right. right. Uh, Mr. Middleton's already left the government. He was on as a consultant for himself at that time. And uh, yeah. hey, can you, you mentioned that there was another Lippo executive uh, besides Mr. Riatti. Do you recall who that was? No, I could not recall. I never saw him before, but he came along uh, with, with Mr. Riotti. This particular visit that we're talking about, September the 26th, 1996, was after the first news stories about the campaign finance scandal had broken on, on television. Do you recall at, at, at when you and Mr. Tree and Mr. Riotti are spending the night at Mr. Tree's place at the Watergate South, whether or not those news stories were the subject of any discussion among the three of you? or among two other people in your presence? I don't, I don't recall specifically on that, no. Okay. And do you recall in, in all of the, the 20 days of, of interviewing that you had with the Department of Justice, did they ever talk to you about this uh, series of limousine rides that you can recall? No. At, at any time on the two receipts that I've shown you, the 502 and 501, uh, was the President of the United States, Mr. Clinton, either before or after the event that occurred at the Sheraton Carlton on September the 26th, uh, in, involved with Mr. Riotti uh, on e any of these trips that this limousine was taken? Mr. Clinton, you say? At the no, no, he was not involved. Are, are you aware of any uh, ride, limousine ride, taken by the President of the United States with Mr. Riotti during this visit by Mr. Riotti uh, to Washington, D.C.? That is, the uh, a day uh, either before or after the September 26th African-American event at the Sheraton Carlton in Washington, D.C.? No, you, sir. You were there? No, sir. Okay. I don't... Uh, do you know how much time I have left, Mr. Souter? Do you know how much... Is there a clock? Just I don't want to start a new area. If I, if I can stop here, but... Uh, yeah, why don't I stop? I, I'll tell you what, I'll yield back my time, and when I come back, I'll ask a... I, if I you want, want to go now and want another 10 minutes, it's okay with me. I, 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 I well, don't know how... You want to give Mr. Wong a break. I, oh, Mr. Oh. Mr. Shea says he'd like to ask a few, and I'm sure... So I'll, I'll yield back at this moment in we'll time, get, and maybe we'll, he wants uh, to take The committee a break. will stand in recess for 10 minutes. Thank you, Con Congressman. <laughs> 